Section 1 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness by William Godwin. Preface Few works of literature are held to be of more general use than those which treat in a methodical and elementary way of the principles of science. But the human mind in every enlightened age is progressive, and the best elementary treatises after a certain time are reduced in value by the operation of subsequent discoveries. Hence it has always been desired by the intelligent that new works of this kind should from time to time be brought forward, including the improvements which had not yet been realized when former compilations upon the subject were produced. It would be strange if something of this kind were not requisite in the science of politics, after the concussion that the minds of men have suffered upon this subject, and the materials that have been furnished by the recent experiments of America and France. A sense of the value of such a work, if properly executed, was the motive which gave birth to these volumes authors who have formed the design of supplying the defects of their predecessors will be found if they were in any degree equal to the task not merely to have collected the scattered information that had been produced upon the subject but to have enlarged the science by the effect of their own meditations in the following work principles will occasionally occur which it will not be just to reject without examination upon the ground of their apparent novelty it was impossible perseveringly to reflect upon so comprehensive a science and a science which may be said to be yet in its infancy without being led into ways of thinking that were in some degree uncommon another argument in favor of the utility of such a work was frequently in the author's mind and therefore ought to be mentioned he conceived politics to be the proper vehicle of a liberal morality that description of ethics will be found perhaps to be worthy of slight estimation which confines itself to petty detail and the offices of private life instead of designing the combined and simultaneous improvement of communities and nations but if individual correction ought not to be the grand purpose of ethics neither ought it be by any means to be overlooked it appears sufficiently practicable to make of such a treatise exclusive of its direct political use an advantageous vehicle for the subordinate purpose the author was accordingly desirous of producing a work from the perusal of which no man should rise without being strengthened in habits of sincerity fortitude and justice having stated the considerations in which the work originated it is proper to mention a few circumstances of the outline of its history it was projected in the month of may seventeen ninety one the composition was begun in the following september and has therefore occupied a space of sixteen months this period was for the most part devoted to the purpose with unusual ardor it were to be wished it had been longer but the state of the public mind and of the general interests of the species operated as a strong argument in favor of an early publication the printing of the following treatise as well as the composition was influenced by the same principle a desire to reconcile a certain degree of dispatch with the necessary deliberation the printing was for that reason commenced long before the composition was finished some disadvantages have arisen from the circumstance the ideas of the author became more perspicuous and digested as his inquiries advanced the longer he considered the subject the more clearly he seemed to understand it this circumstance has led him into some inaccuracies of language and reasoning particularly in the earlier part of the work respecting the properties and utility of government he did not enter upon the subject without being aware that government by its very nature counteracts the improvement of individual intellect but as the views he entertains in this particular are out of the common road it is scarcely to be wondered at that he understood the proposition more completely as he proceeded and so more distinctly into the nature of the remedy 
this defect together with some others might under a different mode of preparation have been avoided the judicious reader will make a suitable allowance the author judges upon a review that the errors are not such as essentially to affect the object of the work and that more has been gained than lost by the conduct he has pursued in addition to what is here stated it may not be useless to describe the progress by which the author's mind was led to its present sentiments they are not the suggestions of any sudden effervescence of fancy political inquiry had long held a considerable place in the writer's attention it is now twelve years since he became satisfied that monarchy was a species of government essentially corrupt he owed this conviction to the political writings of swift and to a perusal of the latin historians nearly at the same time he derived much additional stimulus from several french productions on the nature of man which fell into his hands in the following order the système de la nature the works of rousseau and those of helvetius long before he projected the present work his mind had been familiarized to several of the speculations suggested in it respecting justice gratitude the rights of man promises oaths and the omnipotence of opinion of the desirableness of a government in the utmost degree simple he was not persuaded but in consequence of ideas suggested by the french revolution to the same event he owes the determination of mind which gave birth to the present work the period in which it makes its appearance is singular the people of england have assiduously been excited to declare their loyalty and to mark every man as obnoxious who is not ready to sign the shibboleth of the constitution money is raised by voluntary subscription to defray the expense of prosecuting men who shall dare to promulgate heretical opinions and thus to oppress them at once with the authority of government and the resentment of individuals this was an accident unforeseen when the work was undertaken and it will scarcely be supposed that such an accident could produce any alteration in the writer's designs every man if we may believe the voice of rumour is to be prosecuted who shall appeal to the people by the publication of any unconstitutional paper or pamphlet and it is added that men are to be punished for any unguarded words that may be dropped in the warmth of conversation and debate it is now to be trod whether in addition to these alarming encroachments upon our liberty a book is to fall under the arm of the civil power which beside the advantage of having for one of its express objects the dissuading from tumult and violence is by its very nature an appeal to men of study and reflection it is to be tried whether an attempt shall be made to suppress the activity of mind and put an end to the disquisitions of science respecting the event in a personal view the author has formed his resolution whatever conduct his countrymen may pursue they will not be able to shake his tranquillity the duty he conceives himself most bound to discharge is the assisting the progress of truth and if he suffer in any respect for such a proceeding there is certainly no vicissitude that can befall him that can ever bring along with it a more satisfactory consolation but exclusively of this precarious and unimportant consideration it is the fortune of the present work to appear before a public that is panic-struck and impressed with the most dreadful apprehensions respecting such doctrines as are here delivered all the prejudices of the human mind are in arms against it this circumstance may appear to be more essential than the other but it is the property of truth to be fearless and to prove victorious over every adversary it requires no great deal of fortitude to look with indifference upon the false fire of the moment and to foresee the calm period of reason which will secede london january seventh seventeen ninety three end of section one Section 2 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
inquiry concerning political justice and its influence on morals and happiness by william godwin preface to the second edition the reception of the following work has been such as to exceed what the author dared to promise himself its principles and reasonings have obtained the attention of the public to a considerable extent this circumstance he has construed as imposing upon him the duty of a severe and assiduous revisal every author figures to himself while writing a numerous and liberal attention to his lucubrations if he did not believe that he had something to offer that was worthy of public notice it is impossible that he should write with any degree of animation but the most ardent imagination can scarcely be expected to come in competition with sense in the present instance there are many things that now appear to the author upon a review not to have been meditated with a sufficiently profound reflection and to have been too hastily obtruded upon the reader these things have been pruned away with a liberal hand the wish nearest to his heart is that there should be nothing in the book unworthy of the cause it was intended to serve but though he professes to have done much much yet remains to be done after repeated revisals the jealous eye of a man habituated to the detection of errors still discovers things that might be better some are obscure some are doubtful as to the last the author did not conceive himself at liberty to retract anything without a conviction or something near a conviction that he was wrong he deemed it by no means justifiable to suppress any opinion because it was inconsistent with the prejudice or persuasion of others a circumstance by which it was originally intended that this book should be characterized was a perfect explicitness and unreserve and even if this intention should at last be an improper one it was apparently too late to reverse it it would have been an act incompatible with every pretension to integrity to have rescinded sentiments originally advanced as true so long as they stood forward to the author's mind accompanied by their original evidence it will perhaps be asked by some persons in perusing the present edition how it has happened that the author has varied in so many points from the propositions advanced in the former and this variation may even be treated as a topic of censure to this he has only to answer in the first place that the spirit and great outlines of the work he believes remained untouched and that it is reasoned in various particulars with more accuracy from the premises and fundamental positions than it was before secondly he presumes to ascribe the variations to an industrious and conscientious endeavor to keep his mind awake to correction and improvement he has in several instances detected error and so far is he from feeling mortified at the discovery that he hopes yet by such activity and impartiality as he shall be able to exert to arrive at many truths of which he has scarcely at present perhaps the slightest presentiment some apology is due to the purchasers of the former edition respecting the variations that appear in this it was extremely the wish of the author that the variations should be printed separately for their use but how was this possible they grew under his hands and at last out of eight books of which the work consists the four first and the last may without impropriety be said to be rewritten an obvious alternative unavoidably offers itself if the work be of that useless sort with which the press is daily encumbered these purchasers will not be very solicitous about the variations of such a performance if on the contrary it be a production of any value they will probably sympathize with the author he feels himself particularly indebted to them for having enabled him to bring the work to his present state of correction and it is to be hoped that they will not regret the having been instrumental to that purpose the parts of the work in which the most material variations of deduction or statement appear will be found under the following titles the characters of men originate in their external circumstances the voluntary actions of men originate in their opinions of personal virtue and duty of rights of promises of obedience of forms of government 
illustrations of sincerity of self-love and benevolence of good and evil principles of property and of the supposed advantages of luxury important explanations are also subjoined on the topics of marriage and longevity book eight appendices to chapters eight and nine to these the author would wish particularly to call the attention of his former readers inferior variations are scattered everywhere and are impossible to be enumerated the inquiry concerning political justice has been treated by some persons as of a seditious and inflammatory nature this is probably an aspersion if the political principles in favor of which it is written have no solid foundation they have little chance to obtain more than a temporary fashion and the present work is ill calculated to answer a temporary purpose if on the contrary they be founded in immutable truth it is highly probable to say the least that they will one day gain a decisive ascendancy in that case the tendency of such a disquisition will be to smooth the gradation and to prepare the enlightened to sympathize with the just claims of the oppressed and the humble no man can more fervently deprecate scenes of commotion and tumult than the author of this book no man would more anxiously avoid the lending his assistance in the most distant matter to animosity and bloodshed but he persuades himself that whatever may be the events with which the present crisis of human history shall be distinguished the effect of his writings as far as they are in any degree remembered will be found favorable to the increase and preservation of general kindness and benevolence october twenty ninth seventeen ninety five advertisement the author has not failed to make use of the opportunity afforded him by the third edition to revise the work throughout the alterations however that he has made though numerous are not of a fundamental nature their object has been merely to remove a few of the crude and juvenile remarks which upon consideration he thought himself able to detect in the book as it originally stood july seventeen ninety seven End of section two. Section three of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness by William Godwin summary of principles established and reasoned upon in the following work the reader who would form a just estimate of the reasonings of these volumes cannot perhaps proceed more judiciously than by examining for himself the truth of these principles and the support they afford to the various inferences interspersed throughout the work one the true object of moral and political disquisition is pleasure or happiness the primary or earliest class of human pleasures is the pleasures of the external senses in addition to these man is susceptible of certain secondary pleasures as the pleasures of intellectual feeling the pleasures of sympathy and the pleasures of self-approbation the secondary pleasures are probably more exquisite than the primary or at least the most desirable state of man is that in which he has access to all these sources of pleasure and is in possession of a happiness the most varied and uninterrupted this state is a state of high civilization two the most desirable condition of the human species is a state of society the injustice and violence of men in a state of society produced the demand for government government as it was forced upon mankind by their vices so has it commonly been the creature of their ignorance and mistake government was intended to suppress injustice but it offers new occasions and temptations for the commission of it by concentrating the force of the community it gives occasion to wild projects of calamity to oppression despotism war and conquest 
by perpetuating and aggravating the inequality of property it fosters many injurious passions and excites men to the practice of robbery and fraud government was intended to suppress injustice but its effect has been to embody and perpetuate it three the immediate object of government is security the means employed by government is restriction and abridgment of individual independence the pleasures of self-approbation together with the right cultivation of all our pleasures require individual independence without independence men cannot become either wise or useful or happy consequently the most desirable state of mankind is that which maintains general security with the smallest encroachment upon individual independence four the true standard of the conduct of one man towards another is justice justice is a principle which proposes to itself the production of the greatest sum of pleasure or happiness justice requires that i should put myself in the place of an impartial spectator of human concerns and divest myself of retrospect to my own predilections justice is a rule of the utmost universality and prescribes a specific mode of proceeding in all affairs by which the happiness of a human being may be affected five duty is that mode of action which constitutes the best application of the capacity of the individual to the general advantage right is the claim of the individual to a share of the benefit arising from his neighbor's discharge of their several duties the claim of the individual is either to the exertion or the forbearance of his neighbors the exertion of men in society should ordinarily be trusted to their discretion their forbearance in certain cases is a point of more pressing necessity and is the direct province of political superintendence or government six the voluntary actions of men are under the direction of their feelings reason is not an independent principle and has no tendency to excite us to action in a practical view it is merely a comparison and balancing of different feelings reason though it cannot excite us to action is calculated to regulate our conduct according to the comparative worth it ascribes to different excitements it is to the improvement of reason therefore that we are to look for the improvement of our social condition seven reason depends for its clearness and strength upon the cultivation of knowledge the extent of our progress in the cultivation of knowledge is unlimited hence it follows one that human inventions and the modes of social existence are susceptible of perpetual improvement two that institutions calculated to give perpetuity to any particular mode of thinking or condition of existence are pernicious eight the pleasures of intellectual feeling and the pleasures of self-approbation together with the right cultivation of all our pleasures are connected with soundness of understanding soundness of understanding is inconsistent with prejudice consequently as few falsehoods as possible either speculative or practical should be fostered among mankind soundness of understanding is connected with freedom of inquiry consequently opinion should as far as public security will admit be exempted from restraint soundness of understanding is connected with simplicity of manners and leisure for intellectual cultivation Consequently, a distribution of property extremely unequal is adverse to the most desirable state of man. End of section 3 Section 4 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tina Ding. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness by William Godwin. 
Book One of the Powers of Man Considered in His Social Capacity. Chapter One, Introduction. Subject of Inquiry of the First Book. Received ideas of political institutions. Propriety of these ideas questioned. Plan of the first book. The object proposed in the following work is an investigation concerning that form of public or political society, that system of intercourse and reciprocal action extending beyond the bounds of a single family, which shall be found most to conduce to the general benefit. How may the peculiar and independent operation of each individual in the social state most effectually be preserved? How may the security each man ought to possess as to his life and the employment of his faculties, according to the dictates of his own understanding, be most certainly defended from invasion? How may the individuals of the human species be made to contribute most substantially to the general improvement and happiness? The inquiry here undertaken has for its object to facilitate the solution of these interesting questions. In entering upon this investigation, nothing can be more useful than to examine into the extent of the influence that is to be ascribed to political institutions, in other words, into the powers of men as they have modified or may hereafter modify his social state of existence. Upon this subject, there has been considerable difference of opinion. The most usually received hypothesis is that which considers the effects of government or social institutions whether acting by express regulations or otherwise, as rather of a negative than positive nature. No doubt the purposes for which government was established are in their strictest sense negative, to maintain us in the possession of certain advantages against the occasional hostility either of domestic or foreign invaders. But does the influence of government stop? at the point for the sake of which mankind were first prevailed on to adopt it? Those who believe that it does or can stop at this point necessarily regard it as a matter of subordinate disquisition or at most only coordinate with several others. They survey man in his individual character, in his domestic connections, and in the pursuits and attachments which his feelings may incline him to adopt. These, of course, fill the principal part of the picture. These are supposed by the speculators of whom we now speak to be in ordinary cases independent of all political systems and establishments. It is only in peculiar emergencies and matters that depart from the accustomed routine of affairs that they conceive a private individual to have any occasion to remember or to be in the least affected by the government of his country. If he commit or is supposed to commit any offense against the general welfare, if he find himself called upon to repress the offense of another, or if any danger from foreign hostility threaten the community in which he resides, in these cases and these only is he obliged to recollect that he has a country. These considerations impose upon him the further duty of consulting, even when no immediate danger is nigh, how political liberty may best be maintained and male administration prevented. Many of the best patriots and most popular writers on the subject of government appear to have proceeded upon the principles here delineated. They have treated morality and personal happiness as one science and politics as a different one. But 
while they have considered the virtues and pleasures of mankind as essentially independent of civil policy, they have justly remarked that the security with which the one can be exercised and the other enjoyed will be decided by the wisdom of our public institutions and the equity with which they are administered and have earnestly pressed it upon the attention of mankind not to forget in the rectitude or happiness of the present moment those precautions in that generous plan of power which may tend to render it impregnable to the stratagems of corruption or the insolence of tyranny but while we confess ourselves indebted to the labors of these writers and perhaps still more to the intrepid language and behavior of these patriots, we are incited to inquire whether the topic which engaged their attention be not of higher and more extensive importance than they suspected. Perhaps government is not merely in some cases the defender, and in others the treacherous foe of the domestic virtues. Perhaps it insinuates itself into our personal dispositions and insensibly communicates its own spirit to our private transactions. Were not the inhabitants of ancient Greece and Rome indebted in some degree to their political liberties for their excellence in art and the illustrious theater they occupy in the moral history of mankind? Are not the governments of modern Europe accountable for the slowness and inconstancy of its literary efforts and the unworthy selfishness that characterizes its inhabitants? Is it not owing to the governments of the East that that part of the world can scarcely be said to have made any progress in intellect or science? When skepticism or a spirit of investigation has led us to start these questions, we shall be apt not to stop at them. A wide field of speculation opens itself before us. If government thus insinuates itself in its effects into our most secret retirements, who shall define the extent of its operation? If it be the author of this much, who shall specify the points from which its influence is excluded? May it not happen that the grand moral evils that exist in the world, the calamities by which we are so grievously oppressed, are to be traced to political institutions as their source, and that their removal is only to be expected from its correction? May it not be found that the attempt to alter the morals of mankind singly and in detail is an injudicious and futile undertaking, and that the change of their political institutions must keep pace with their advancement in knowledge if we expect to secure to them a real and permanent improvement. To prove the affirmative of these questions shall be the business of this first book. The method to be pursued for that purpose shall be first to take a concise survey of the evils existing in political society secondly to show that these evils are to be ascribed to public institutions and thirdly that they are not the inseparable condition of our existence but admit of removal and remedy end of section four Section 5 of The Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in January 2020. And now inquiry concerning political justice and its influence on morals and happiness by william godwin published seventeen hundred ninety three book one chapter two the history of political society war 
frequency of war among the ancients among the moderns the french the english causes of war penal laws despotism deduction from the whole the extent of the influence of political systems will be forcibly illustrated by a concise recollection of the records of political society it is an old observation that the history of mankind is little else than the record of crimes if we consider the human species as they were found previously to the existence of political society it is difficult not to be impressed with emotions of melancholy but though the chief purpose of society is to defend us from want and inconvenience it affects this purpose in a very imperfect degree we are still liable to casualties disease infirmity and death Famine destroys its thousands, and pestilence its ten thousands. Anguish visits us under every variety of form, and day after day is spent in languor and dissatisfaction. Exquisite pleasure is a guest of very rare approach, and not less short continuance. But though the evils that arise to us from the structure of the material universe are neither trivial nor few, yet the history of political society sufficiently shows that man is of all other beings the most formidable enemy to man. Among the various schemes that he has formed to destroy and plague his kind, war is the most terrible satiated with petty mischief and the retail of insulated crimes he rises in this instance to a project that lays nations waste and thins the population of the world man directs the murderous engine against the life of his brother he invents with indefatigable care refinements in destruction he proceeds in the midst of gaiety and pomp to the execution of his horrid purpose whole ranks of sensitive beings endowed with the most admirable faculties are mowed down in an instant they perish by inches in the midst of agony and neglect lacerated with every variety of method that can give torture to the frame this is indeed a tremendous scene are we permitted to console ourselves under the spectacle of its evils by the rareness with which it occurs and the forcible reasons that compel men to have recourse to this last appeal of human society let us consider it under each of these heads war has hitherto been found the inseparable ally of political institutions the earliest records of time are the annals of conquerors and heroes a bacchus a sesostris a semiramis and a cyrus these princes led millions of men under their standard and ravaged innumerable provinces a small number only of their forces ever returned to their native homes the rest having perished by diseases hardship and misery the evils they inflicted and the mortality introduced in the countries against which their expeditions were directed were certainly not less severe than those which their countrymen suffered no sooner does history become more precise than we are presented with the four great monarchies that is with four successful projects by means of bloodshed violence and murder of enslaving mankind the expeditions of cambyses against egypt of darius against the scythians and of xerxes against the greeks seem almost to set credibility at defiance by the fatal consequences with which they were attended the conquests of alexander cost innumerable lives and the immortality of caesar is computed to have been purchased by the death of one million two hundred thousand men indeed the romans by the long duration of their wars and their inflexible adherence to their purpose are to be ranked among the foremost destroyers of the human species their wars in italy continued for more than four hundred years and their contest for supremacy with the carthaginians two hundred the mithridatic war began with a massacre of one hundred and fifty thousand romans and in three single actions five hundred thousand men were lost by the eastern monarch Scylla, his ferocious conqueror next turned his arms against his country and the struggle between him and marius was attended with proscriptions butcheries and murders that knew no restraint from humanity or shame 
the romans at length suffered the evils they had been so prompt to inflict upon others and the world was vexed for three hundred years with the eruptions of goths vandals ostrogoths huns and innumerable hordes of barbarians i forbear to detail the victorious progress of mohammed and the pious expeditions of charlemagne i will not enumerate the crusades against the infidels the exploits of tamerlane genghis khan and aurangzeb or the extensive murders of the spaniards in the new world let us examine europe the most civilized and favored quarter of the world or even those countries of europe which are thought the most enlightened france was wasted by successive battles during the whole century for the question of salic law and the claim of the plantagenets scarcely was this contest terminated before the religious wars broke out some idea of which we may form from the siege of rochelle where of fifteen thousand persons shut up eleven thousand perished of hunger and misery and from the massacre of st bartholomew in which the numbers assassinated were forty thousand this quarrel was appeased by henry the fourth and succeeded by the thirty years war in germany for superiority with the house of austria and afterwards by the military transactions of louis the fourteenth in england the war of cressy and agincourt only gave place to the civil war of york and lancaster and again after an interval to the war of charles the first and his parliament no sooner was the constitution settled by the revolution than we were engaged in a wide field of continental hostilities by king william the duke of marlborough maria theresa and the king of prussia and what are in most cases the pretences upon which war is undertaken what rational man could possibly have given himself the least disturbance for the sake of choosing whether henry the sixth or edward the fourth should have the style of king of england what Englishman could reasonably have drawn his sword for the purpose of rendering his country an inferior dependency of France, as it must necessarily have been if the ambition of the Plantagenets had succeeded? What can be more deplorable than to see us first engage eight years in a war rather than suffer the haughty Maria Theresa to live with a diminished sovereignty or in a private station? and then eight years more to support the freebooter who had taken advantage of her helpless condition the usual causes of war are excellently described by jonathan swift gulliver's travels part four chapter five Quote, sometimes the quarrel between two princes is to decide which of them shall dispossess a third of his dominions where neither of them pretends to any right sometimes one prince quarrels with another for fear the other should quarrel with him sometimes a war is entered upon because the enemy is too strong and sometimes because he is too weak sometimes our neighbors want the things which we have or have the things which we want and we both fight till they take ours or give us theirs it is a very justifiable cause of war to invade a country after the people have been wasted by famine destroyed by pestilence or embroiled by factions among themselves it is justifiable to enter into a war against our nearest ally when one of his towns lies convenient for us or a territory of land that would render our dominions round and compact if a prince sends forces into a nation where the people are poor and ignorant he may lawfully put the half of them to death and make slaves of the rest in order to civilize and reduce them from their barbarous way of living it is a very kingly honorable and frequent practice when one prince desires the assistance of another to secure him against an invasion that the assistant when he has driven out the invader should seize on the dominions himself and kill imprison or banish the prince he came to relieve Close quote if we turn from the foreign transactions of states with each other to the principles of their domestic policy we shall not find much greater reason to be satisfied a numerous class of mankind are held down in a state of abject penury and are continually prompted by disappointment and distress to commit violence upon their more fortunate neighbors the only mode which is employed to repress this violence and to maintain the order and peace of society is punishment 
whips axes and gibbets dungeons chains and racks are the most approved and established methods of persuading men to obedience and impressing upon their minds the lessons of reason there are few subjects upon which human ingenuity has been more fully displayed than in inventing instruments of torture the lash of the whip a thousand times repeated on the back of the defenceless victim the bastinado on the soles of the feet the dislocation of limbs the fracture of bones the faggot and the stake the cross impaling and the mode of drifting pirates on the volga make but a small part of the catalogue when damiens the maniac was arraigned for his abortive attempt on the life of louis the fifteenth of france the council of anatomists was summoned to deliberate how a human being might be destroyed with the longest protracted and most diversified agony hundreds of victims are annually sacrificed at the shrine of positive law and political institution add to this the species of government which prevails over nine-tenths of the globe which is despotism a government as john locke justly observes in his book on government quote, altogether vile and miserable and more to be deprecated than anarchy itself Close quote. certainly every man who takes a dispassionate survey of this picture will feel himself inclined to pause respecting the necessity of the havoc which is thus made of his species and to question whether the established methods for protecting mankind against the caprices of each other are the best that can be devised he will be at a loss which of the two to pronounce most worthy of regret the misery that is inflicted or the depravity by which it is produced if this be the unalterable allotment of our nature the eminence of our rational faculties must be considered as rather an abortion than a substantial benefit and we shall not fail to lament that while in some respects we are elevated above the brutes we are in so many important ones destined for ever to remain their inferiors End of section five section six of inquiry concerning political justice and its influence on morals and happiness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org this recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana inquiry concerning political justice and its influence on morals and happiness by william godwin book one chapter three spirit of political institutions robbery and fraud two great vices in society originate one in extreme poverty two in the ostentation of the rich three in their tyranny rendered permanent one by legislation two by the administration of law and three by the manner in which property is distributed additional perspicuity will be communicated to our view of the evils of political society if we reflect with further and closer attention upon what may be called its interior and domestic history two of the greatest abuses relative to the interior policy of nations which at this time prevail in the world consist in the irregular transfer of property either first by violence or secondly by fraud if among the inhabitants of any country there existed no desire in one individual to possess himself of the substance of another or no desire so vehement and restless as to prompt him to acquire it by means inconsistent with order and justice undoubtedly in that country guilt could scarcely be known but by report if every man could with perfect facility obtain the necessaries of life and obtaining them feel no uneasy craving after its superfluities temptation would lose its power private interest would visibly accord with public good and civil society become what poetry has feigned of the golden age let us inquire into the principles to which these abuses are indebted for their existence first then it is to be observed that in the most refined states of europe the inequality of property has risen to an alarming height 
vast numbers of their inhabitants are deprived of almost every accommodation that can render life tolerable or secure their utmost industry scarcely suffices for their support the women and children lean with an insupportable weight upon the efforts of the man so that a large family has in the lower orders of life become a proverbial expression for an uncommon degree of poverty and wretchedness if sickness or some of those casualties which are perpetually incident to an active and laborious life be added to these burdens the distress is yet greater it seems to be agreed that in england there is less wretchedness and distress than in most of the kingdoms of the continent in england the poor's rates amount to the sum of two millions sterling per annum it has been calculated that one person in seven of the inhabitants of this country derives at some period of his life assistance from this fund if to this we add the persons who from pride a spirit of independence or the want of a legal settlement though in equal distress receive no such assistance the proportion will be considerably increased i lay no stress upon the accuracy of this calculation the general fact is sufficient to give us an idea of the greatness of the abuse the consequences that result are placed beyond the reach of contradiction a perpetual struggle with the evils of poverty if frequently ineffectual must necessarily render many of the sufferers desperate a painful feeling of their oppressed situation will itself deprive them of the power of surmounting it the superiority of the rich being thus unmercifully exercised must inevitably expose them to reprisals and the poor man will be induced to regard the state of society as a state of war an unjust combination not for protecting every man in his rights and securing to him the means of existence but for engrossing all its advantages to a few favored individuals and reserving for the portion of the rest want dependence and misery a second source of those destructive passions by which the peace of society is interrupted is to be found in the luxury the pageantry the magnificence with which enormous wealth is usually accompanied human beings are capable of encountering with cheerfulness considerable hardships when those hardships are impartially shared with the rest of society and they are not insulted with the spectacle of indolence and ease in others no way deserving of greater advantages than themselves but it is a bitter aggravation of their own calamity to have the privileges of others forced on their observation and while they are perpetually and vainly endeavouring to secure for themselves and their families the poorest conveniences to find others revelling in the fruits of their labours this aggravation is assiduously administered to them under most of the political establishments at present in existence there is a numerous class of individuals who though rich have neither brilliant talents nor sublime virtues and however highly they may prize their education their affability their superior polish and the elegance of their manners have a secret consciousness that they possess nothing by which they can so securely assert their preeminence and keep their inferiors at a distance as the splendor of their equipage the magnificence of their retinue and the sumptuousness of their entertainments the poor man is struck with this exhibition he feels his own miseries he knows how unwearied are his efforts to obtain a slender pittance of this prodigal waste and he mistakes opulence for felicity he cannot persuade himself that an embroidered garment may frequently cover an aching heart a third disadvantage that is apt to connect poverty with discontent consists in the insolence and usurpation of the rich if the poor man would in other respects compose himself in philosophic indifference and conscious that he possesses everything that is truly honourable to man as fully as his rich neighbour would look upon the rest as beneath his envy his neighbour will not permit him to do so he seems as if he could never be satisfied with his possessions unless he can make the spectacle of them grating to others and that honest self-esteem by which his inferior might otherwise attain to tranquillity is rendered the instrument of galling him with oppression and injustice in many countries justice is avowedly made a subject of solicitation 
and the man of the highest rank and most splendid connections almost infallibly carries his cause against the unprotected and friendless in countries where this shameless practice is not established justice is frequently a matter of expensive purchase and the man with the longest purse is proverbially victorious a consciousness of these facts must be expected to render the rich little cautious of offence in his dealings with the poor and to inspire him with a temper overbearing dictatorial and tyrannical nor does this indirect oppression satisfy his despotism the rich are in all such countries directly or indirectly the legislators of the state and of consequence are perpetually reducing oppression into a system and depriving the poor of that little commonage of nature which might otherwise still have remained to them the opinions of individuals and of consequence their desires for desire is nothing but opinion matured for action will always be in a great degree regulated by the opinions of the community but the manners prevailing in many countries are accurately calculated to impress a conviction that integrity virtue understanding and industry are nothing and that opulence is everything does a man whose exterior denotes indigence expect to be well received in society and especially by those who would be understood to dictate to the rest does he find or imagine himself in want of their assistance and favour is he presently taught that no merit can atone for a mean appearance the lesson that is read to him is go home enrich yourself by whatever means obtain those superfluities which are alone regarded as estimable and you may then be secure of an amicable reception accordingly poverty in such countries is viewed as the greatest of demerits it is escaped from with an eagerness that has no leisure for the scruples of honesty it is concealed as the most indelible disgrace while one man chooses the path of undistinguishing accumulation another plunges into expenses which are to impose him upon the world as more opulent than he is he hastens to the reality of that penury the appearance of which he dreads and together with his property sacrifices the integrity veracity and character which might have consoled him in his adversity such are the causes that in different degrees under the different governments of the world prompt mankind openly or secretly to encroach upon the property of each other let us consider how far they admit either of remedy or aggravation from political institution whatever tends to decrease the injuries attendant upon poverty decreases at the same time the inordinate desire and the enormous accumulation of wealth wealth is not pursued for its own sake and seldom for the sensual gratification it can purchase but for the same reasons that ordinarily prompt men to the acquisition of learning eloquence and skill for the love of distinction and the fear of contempt how few would prize the possession of riches if they were condemned to enjoy their equipage their palaces and their entertainments in solitude with no eye to wonder at their magnificence and no sordid observer ready to convert that wonder into an adulation of the owner if admiration were not generally deemed the exclusive property of the rich and contempt the constant lackey of poverty the love of gain would cease to be an universal passion let us consider in what respects political institution is rendered subservient to this passion first then legislation is in almost every country grossly the favourer of the rich against the poor such is the character of the game laws by which the industrious rustic is forbidden to destroy the animal that preys upon the hopes of his future subsistence or to supply himself with the food that unsought thrusts itself in his path such was the spirit of the late revenue laws of france which in several of their provisions fell exclusively upon the humble and industrious and exempted from their operation those who were best able to support it thus in england the land tax at this moment produces half a million less than it did a century ago while the taxes on consumption have experienced an addition of thirteen millions per annum during the same period 
this is an attempt whether effectual or no to throw the burthen from the rich upon the poor and as such is an example of the spirit of legislation upon the same principle robbery and other offences which the wealthier part of the community have no temptation to commit are treated as capital crimes and attended with the most rigorous often the most inhuman punishments the rich are encouraged to associate for the execution of the most partial and oppressive positive laws monopolies and patents are lavishly dispensed to such as are able to purchase them while the most vigilant policy is employed to prevent combinations of the poor to fix the price of labor and they are deprived of the benefit of that prudence and judgment which would select the scene of their industry secondly the administration of law is not less iniquitous than the spirit in which it is framed under the late government of france the office of judge was a matter of purchase partly by an open price advanced to the crown and partly by a secret douceur paid to the minister he who knew best how to manage his market in the retail trade of justice could afford to purchase the good will of its functions at the highest price to the client justice was avowedly made an object of personal solicitation and the powerful friend a handsome woman or a proper present were articles of much greater value than a good cause in england the criminal law is administered with greater impartiality so far as regards the trial itself but the number of capital offences and of consequence the frequency of pardons open a wide door to favour and abuse in causes relating to property the practice of law is arrived at such a pitch as to render its nominal impartiality utterly nugatory the length of our chancery suits the multiplied appeals from court to court the enormous fees of counsel attorneys secretaries clerks the drawing of briefs bills replications and rejoinders and what has sometimes been called the glorious uncertainty of the law render it frequently more advisable to resign a property than to contest it and particularly exclude the impoverished claimant from the faintest hope of redress thirdly the inequality of conditions usually maintained by political institutions is calculated greatly to enhance the imagined excellence of wealth in the ancient monarchies of the east and in turkey at the present day an eminent station could scarcely fail to excite implicit deference the timid inhabitant trembled before his superior and would have thought it little less than blasphemy to touch the veil drawn by the proud satrap over his inglorious origin the same principles were extensively prevalent under the feudal system the vassal who was regarded as a sort of live stock upon the estate and knew no appeal from the arbitrary fiat of his lord would scarcely venture to suspect that he was of the same species this however constituted an unnatural and violent situation there is a propensity in man to look further than the outside and to come with a writ of inquiry into the title of the upstart and the successful by the operation of these causes the insolence of wealth has been in some degree moderated meantime it cannot be pretended that even among ourselves the inequality is not strained so as to give birth to very unfortunate consequences if in the enormous degree in which it prevails in some parts of the world it wholly debilitate and emasculate the human race we shall see some reason to believe that even in the milder state in which we are accustomed to behold it it is still pregnant with the most mischievous effects. End of section six. Section seven of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones, Benita Springs, Florida. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness by William Godwin Chapter 4 The Characters of Men Originate in Their External Circumstances Preliminary Remarks and a Footnote 
In the plan of this work it was originally conceived that it was advisable not to press matters of close and laborious speculation in the outset. It appeared as if moral and political philosophy might assume something more than had been usual of a popular form, without deducting from the justness and depth of its investigation. Upon revisal, however, it was found that the inferences of the first book had been materially injured by an over-scrupulousness in that point. The fruit of the discovery was this and the following chapter, as they now stand. It is recommended to the reader who finds himself deterred by their apparent difficulty to pass on to the remaining divisions of the inquiry. Footnote. Some persons have of late suggested doubts concerning the propriety of the use of the word mind. An accurate philosophy has led modern inquirers to question the existence of two classes of substance in the universe, to ject the metaphysical denominations of spirit and soul, and even to doubt whether human beings have any satisfactory acquaintance with the properties of matter. The same accuracy, it has been said, ought to teach us to discard the term mind. But this objection seems to be premature. We are indeed fully uncertain whether the causes of our sensations, heat, color, hardness, and extension, the two former of these properties have been questioned in a very forcible manner by Locke, human understanding, the two latter by Barclay and Hume, be in any respect similar to the ideas they produce. We know nothing of the substance or substratum of matter, or of that which is the recipient of thought and perception. We do not even know that the idea annexed to the word substance is correct, nor has any counterpart in the reality of existence. But if there be any one thing that we know more certainly than another, it is the existence of our own thoughts, ideas, perceptions, or sensations, by whatever term we may choose to express them, and that they are ordinarily linked together so as to produce the complex notion of unity or personal identity. Now it is this series of thoughts thus linked together, without considering whether they reside in any or what substratum, that is most aptly expressed by the term mind, and in this sense the term is intended to be used throughout the following work. End of preliminary remarks and a footnote. Thus far we have argued from historical facts, and from them have collected a very strong presumptive evidence that political institutions have a more powerful and extensive influence than it has been generally the practice to ascribe to them. But we can never arrive at precise conceptions relative to this part of the subject without entering into an analysis of the human mind and endeavoring to ascertain the nature of the causes by which its operations are directed. Under this branch of the subject I shall attempt to prove two things. First, that the actions and dispositions of mankind are the offspring of circumstances and events and not of any original determination that they bring into the world, and secondly, that the great stream of our voluntary actions essentially depends not upon the direct and immediate impulses of sense, but upon the decisions of the understanding. If these propositions can be sufficiently established, it will follow that the happiness men are able to obtain is proportioned to the justness of the opinions they take as guides in the pursuit and it will only remain, for the purpose of applying these premises, to the point under consideration that we should demonstrate the opinions of men to be, for the most part, under the absolute control of political institution. First, the actions and dispositions of men are not the offspring of any original bias that they bring into the world in favor of one sentiment or character rather than another, but flow entirely from the operation of circumstances and events acting upon a faculty of receiving sensible impressions. There are three modes in which the human mind has been conceived to be modified independently of the circumstances which occur to us, and the sensations excited. First, innate principles. Secondly, instincts. Thirdly, the original differences of our structure together with the impressions we receive in the womb, let us examine each of these in their order. First, 
innate principles of judgment. Those by whom this doctrine has been maintained have supposed that there were certain branches of knowledge, and those perhaps of all others the most important, concerning which we felt an irresistible persuasion, at the same time that we were wholly unable to trace them through any channels of external evidence and methodical deduction. They conceived, therefore, that they were originally written in our hearts, or perhaps more properly speaking, that there was a general propensity in the human mind, suggesting them to our reflections and fastening them upon our conviction. Accordingly, they established the universal consent of mankind as one of the most infallible criterions of fundamental truth. It appeared upon their system that we were furnished with a sort of sixth sense, the existence of which was not proved to us, like that of our other senses, by direct and proper evidence, but from the consideration of certain phenomena in the history of the human mind, which cannot otherwise be accounted for than by the assumption of this hypothesis. There is an essential deficiency in every speculation of this sort. It turns entirely upon an appeal to our ignorance. Its language is as follows, quote, You cannot account for certain events from the known laws of the subjects to which they belong. Therefore, they are not deducible from these laws. Therefore, you must admit a new principle into the system for the express purpose of accounting for them. Close quote. But there cannot be a sounder maximum of reasoning than that which points out to us the error of admitting into our hypothesis unnecessary principles or referring the phenomena that occur to remote and extraordinary sources when they may with equal facility be referred to sources which obviously exist and the result of which we daily observe. This maxim alone is sufficient to persuade us to reject the doctrine of innate principles. If we consider the infinitely various causes by which the human mind is perceptibly modified, and the different principles, arguments, imitation, inclination, early prejudice, and imaginary interest by which opinion is generated, we shall readily perceive that nothing can be more difficult than to assign any opinion existing among the human species, and at the same time incapable of being generated by any of these causes and principles. A careful inquirer will be strongly inclined to suspect the soundness of opinions which rest for their support on so ambiguous a foundation as that of innate impression. We cannot reasonably question the existence of facts, that is, we cannot deny the existence of our sensations, or this series in which they occur. Quote, we cannot deny the axioms of mathematics, for they exhibit nothing more than a consistent use of words, and affirm of some idea that it is itself and not something else. We can entertain little doubt of the validity of mathematical demonstrations, which appear to be irresistible conclusions deduced from identical propositions. We ascribe a certain value, sometimes greater and sometimes less, to considerations drawn from analogy. But what degree of weight shall we attribute to affirmations which pretend to rest upon none of these grounds? The most preposterous propositions, incapable of any rational defense, have in different ages and countries appealed to this inexplicable authority, and passed for infallible and innate. The inquirer that has no other object than truth, that refuses to be misled, and is determined to proceed only upon just and sufficient evidence, will find little reason to be satisfied with dogmas which rest upon no other foundation than a pretended necessity impelling the human mind to yield its assent. But there is still more irresistible argument proving to us the absurdity of the supposition of innate principles. Every principle is a proposition. Either it affirms or it denies. Every proposition consists in the connection of at least two distinct ideas which are affirmed to agree or disagree with each other. It is impossible that the proposition can be innate unless the ideas to which it relates be also innate. A connection where there is nothing to be connected, a proposition where there is neither a subject nor conclusion, is the most incoherent of all suppositions, but nothing can be more incontrovertible 
than that we do not bring pre-established ideas into the world with us. Let the innate principle be that, quote, virtue is a rule to which we are obliged to conform, close quote. Here are three principal and leading ideas, not to mention subordinate ones, which it is necessary to form before we can so much as understand the proposition. What is virtue? Previously to our forming an idea corresponding to this general term, it seems necessary that we should have observed the several features by which virtue is distinguished, and the several subordinate articles of right conduct that, taken together, constitute that mass of practical judgments to which we give the denomination of virtue. These are so far from being innate that the most impartial and laborious inquirers are not yet agreed respecting them. The next idea included in the above proposition is that of a rule or standard, a generical measure with which individuals are to be compared, and their conformity or disagreement with which it is to determine their value. Lastly, there is the idea of obligation, its nature and source, the obliger and the sanction, the penalty and the reward. Who is there in the present state of scientific improvement that will believe that this vast chain of perceptions and notions is something that we bring into the world with us, a mystical magazine shut up in the human embryo, whose treasures are to be gradually unfolded as circumstances shall require? Who does not perceive that they are regularly generated in the mind by a series of impressions and digested and arranged by association and reflection? But if we are not endowed with innate principles of judgment, it has nevertheless been supposed by some persons that we might have instincts to action, leading us to the performance of certain useful and necessary functions independently of any previous reasoning as to give the advantage of these functions. These instincts, like the innate principles of judgment we have already examined, are conceived to be original, a separate endowment annexed to our being, and not anything that irresistibly flows from the mere faculty of perception and thought, as acted upon by the circumstances either of our animal frame or of the external objects by which we are affected. They are liable, therefore, to the same objection as that already urged against innate principles. The system by which they are attempted to be established is a mere appeal to our ignorance, assuming that we are fully acquainted with all the possible operations of known powers, and imposing upon us an unknown power as indispensable to the accounting for certain phenomena. If we were wholly unable to solve these phenomena, it would yet behoove us to be extremely cautious in affirming that known principles and causes are inadequate to their solution. If we are able, upon strict and mature investigation, to trace the greater part of them to their source, this unnecessarily adds force to the caution here recommended. An unknown cause is exceptionable. In the first place, inasmuch as to multiply causes is contrary to the experienced operation of scientific improvement. It is exceptionable, secondly, because its tendency is to break that train of antecedents in consequence, of which the history of the universe is composed. It introduces an action apparently extraneous, instead of imputing the nature of what follows to the properties of that which preceded. It bars the progress of inquiry by introducing that which is occult, mysterious, and incapable of further investigation. It allows nothing to the future advancement of human knowledge, but represents the limits of what is already known as the limits of human understanding. Let us review a few of the most common examples adduced in favor of human instincts, and examine how far they authorize the conclusion that is attempted to be drawn from them. And first, some of those actions which appear to rise in the most instantaneous and irresistible manner. A certain irritation of the palm of the hand will produce that contraction of the fingers which accompanies the action of grasping. This contraction will at first take place unaccompanied with design. The object will be grasped without any intention to retain it, and let go again without thought or observation. After a certain number of repetitions, the nature of the action will be perceived, it will be performed with a consciousness of its tendency, 
and even the hand stretched out upon the approach of any object that is desired. Present to the child, thus far instructed, a lighted candle. The sight of it will produce a pleasurable state of the organs of perception. He will probably stretch out his hand to the flame, and will have no apprehension of the pain of burning till he has felt this sensation. At the age of maturity, the eyelids instantaneously close, when any substance from which danger is apprehended is advanced toward them, and this action is so constant as to be with great difficulty prevented by a grown person, though he should explicitly desire it. In infants there is no such propensity, and an object may be approached to their organs, however near and however suddenly, without producing this effect. Frowns will be totally indifferent to a child who has never found them associated with the effects of anger. Fear itself is a species of foresight, and in no case exists till introduced by experience. It has been said that the desire of self-preservation is innate. I demand what is meant by this desire. Must we not understand by it a preference of existence to non-existence? Do we prefer anything but because it is apprehended to be good? It follows that we cannot prefer existence previously to our experience of the motives for preference it possesses. Indeed, the ideas of life and death are exceedingly complicated and very tardy in their formation. A child desires pleasure and loathes pain long before he can have any imagination respecting the ceasing to exist. Again it has been said that self-love is innate, but there cannot be an error more easy of detection. By love of self we understand the approbation of pleasure and the dislike of pain, but this is only the faculty of perception under another name. Who ever denied that man was a percipient being? Who ever dreamed that there was a particular instinct necessary to render him percipient? Pity has sometimes been supposed an instance of innate principle. Particularly, it seems to arise with greater facility in young persons and persons of little refinement than in others. But it was reasonable to expect that threats and anger, circumstances that have been associated with our own sufferings, should excite painful feelings in us in the case of others independently of any labored analysis. The cries of distress, the appearance of agony or corporeal infliction, irresistibly revive the memory of the pains accompanied by those symptoms in ourselves. Longer experience and observation enables us to separate the calamities of others from our own safety, the existence of pain in one subject and of pleasure or benefit in others, or in the same at a future period more accurately than we could be expected to do previously to that experience. It then appears that the human mind is unattended either with innate principles or instincts. There are only two remaining circumstances that can be imagined to anticipate the effects of institution and fix the human character independently of every species of education. These are the qualities that may be produced in the human mind previously to the era of our birth and the differences that may result from the different structures of the greater or subtler elements of the animal frame. To objections derived from these sources, the answer will be in both cases similar. First, ideas are to the mind nearly what atoms are to the body. The whole mass is in a perpetual flux, nothing is stable and permanent. After the lapse of a given period, not a single particle probably remains the same. Who knows not that in the course of a human life the character of the individual frequently undergoes two or three revolutions of its fundamental stamina? The turbulent man will frequently become contemplative, the generous be changed into selfish, and the frank and good-humoured into peevish and morose. How often does it happen that, if we meet our best-loved friend after an absence of twenty years, we look in vain in the man before us for the qualities that formerly excited our sympathy, and instead of the exquisite delight we promised ourselves, reap nothing but disappointment? If it is thus in habits apparently the most rooted, who will be disposed to lay any extraordinary stress upon the impressions which an infant may have received in the womb of his mother? He that considers human life with an attentive eye 
will not fail to remark that there is scarcely such a thing in character and principles as an irremediable error. Persons of narrow and limited views may upon many occasions incline to sit down in despair, but those who are inspired with genuine energy will derive new incentives from miscarriage. Has any unfortunate and undesirable impression been made upon the youthful mind? Nothing will be more easy than for a judicious superintendent, provided its nature is understood, and it is undertaken sufficiently early, to remedy and obliterate it. Has a child passed a certain period of existence in ill-judge indulgence and habits of command and caprice? The skillful parent, when a child returns to its paternal roof, knows that this evil is not invincible, and sets himself with an undoubting spirit to the removal of the depravity. It often happens that the very impression, which if not counteracted, shall decide upon the pursuits and fortune of an entire life, might perhaps under other circumstances be reduced to complete inefficiency in half an hour. It is in corporeal structure as in intellectual impressions. The first impressions of our infancy are so much upon the surface that their effects scarcely survive the period of the impression itself. The mature man seldom retains the faintest recollection of the incidents of the first two years of his life. Is it to be supposed that that which has left no trace upon the memory can be in an imminent degree powerful in its associated effects? Just so in the structure of the animal frame. What is born into the world is an unfinished sketch, without character or decisive feature impressed upon it. In the sequel there is a correspondence between the physiognomy and the intellectual and moral qualities of the mind, but is it not reasonable to suppose that this is produced by the continual tendency of the mind to modify its material engine in a particular way? There is, for the most part, no essential difference between the child of the Lord and of the porter, provided he do not come into the world infected with any ruinous distemper. The child of the Lord, if changed in the cradle, would scarcely find any greater difficulty than the other in learning the trade of his foster father and becoming a carrier of burdens. The muscles of those limbs which are most frequently called into play are always observed to acquire peculiar flexibility or strength. It is not improbable, if it should be found that the capacity of the skull of a wise man is greater than that of a fool, that this enlargement should be produced by the incessantly repeated action of the intellectual faculties, especially if we recollect of how flexible materials the skulls of infants are composed, and at how early an age persons of eminent intellectual merit acquire some portion of their future characteristics. In the meantime, it would be ridiculous to question the real differences that exist between children at the period of their birth. Hercules and his brother, the robust infant, whom scarcely any neglect can destroy, and the infant that is with difficulty reared, are undoubtedly from the moment of parturation very different beings. If each of them could receive an education precisely equal and eminently wise, the child laboring under original disadvantage would be benefited. But the child to whom circumstances had been most favorable in the outset would always retain his priority. These considerations, however, do not appear materially to affect the doctrine of the present chapter, and that for the following reasons. First, education can never be equal. The inequality of external circumstances in two beings whose situation most nearly resemble is so great as to defy all power of calculation. In the present state of mankind this is eminently the case. There is no fact more palpable than that children of all sizes and forms indifferently become wise. It is not the man of great stature or vigorous make that outstrips his fellow in understanding. It is not the man who possesses all the external senses in the highest perfection, it is not the man whose health is most vigorous and invariable. Those moral causes that awaken the mind, that inspire sensibility, imagination, and perseverance, are distributed without distinction to the tall or the dwarfish, the graceful or the deformed, 
the lynx-eyed or the blind. But if the more obvious distinctions of animal structure appear to have little share in deciding upon their associated varieties of intellect, it is surely in the highest degree unjustifiable to attribute these varieties to such subtle and imperceptible difference as being out of our power to assign or yet gratuitously assumed to account for the most stupendous effects this mysterious solution is the refuge of indolence or the instrument of imposture but incompatible with the sober and persevering spirit of investigation secondly it is sufficient to recollect the nature of moral causes to be satisfied that their efficiency is nearly unlimited the essential differences that are to be found between individual and individual originate in the opinions they form and the circumstances by which they are controlled it is impossible to believe that the same moral training would not make nearly the same man let us suppose a being to have heard all the arguments and been subject to all the excitements that were ever addressed to any celebrated character the same arguments with all their strength and all their weakness unaccompanied with the smallest addition or variation and retailed in exactly the same proportion from month to month and year to year must surely have produced the same opinions the same excitements without reservation were the direct or accidental must have fixed the same propensities whatever science or pursuit was selected by this celebrated character must be loved by the person respecting whom we are supposing this identity of impressions in fine it is impression that makes the man and compared with the empire of impression the mere differences of animal structure are inexpressibly unimportant and powerless these truths will be brought to our minds with much additional evidence if we compare in this respect the case of brutes with that of men among the inferior animals breed is a circumstance of considerable importance and a judicious mixture and preservation in this point is found to be attended with the most unequivocal results but nothing of that kind appears to take place in our own species a generous blood a gallant and fearless spirit is by no means propagated from father to son when a particular appellation is granted as is usually practiced in the existing governments of europe to designate the descendants of a magnanimous ancestry we do not find even with all the arts of modern education to assist that such descendants are the legitimate representatives of departed heroism whence comes this difference probably from the more irresistible operation of moral causes it is not impossible that among savages those differences would be conspicuous which with us are annihilated it is not unlikely that if men like brutes were withheld from the more considerable means of intellectual improvement if they derived nothing from the discoveries and sagacity of their ancestors if each individual had to begin absolutely de novo in the discipline and arrangement of his ideas blood or whatever other circumstances distinguish one man from another at the period of his nativity would produce as memorable effects in men as they now do in those classes of animals that are deprived of our advantages even in the case of brutes education and care on the part of man seem to be nearly indispensable if we would not have the fool of the finest racer degenerate to the level of a cart horse in plants the peculiarities of soil decide in a great degree upon the future properties of each but who would think of forming the character of a human being by the operations of heat and cold dryness and moisture upon the animal frame with us moral considerations swallow up the effects of every other accident present a pursuit to the mind convey to it the apprehension of calamity or advantage excite it by motives of aversion or motives of affection and the slow and silent influence of material causes perishes like the dews at the rising of the sun the result of these considerations is that at the moment of birth man has really a certain character and each man a character different from his fellows the accidents which pass during the months of 
percipiency in the womb of the mother produce a real effect various external accidents unlimited as to the period of their commencement modify in different ways the elements of the animal frame everything in the universe is linked and united together no event however minute and imperceptible is barren of a train of consequences however comparatively evanescent those consequences may in some instances be found if there have been philosophers that have asserted otherwise and taught that all minds from the period of birth were precisely alike they have reflected discredit by such an incautious statement upon the truth they propose to defend but though the original differences of man and man be arithmetically speaking something speaking in the way of a general and comprehensive estimate they may be said to be almost nothing if the early impressions of our childhood made by a skilful observer be as it were obliterated almost as soon as made how much less can the confused and unpronounced impressions of the womb be expected to resist the multiplicity of ideas that successively contribute to wear out their traces if the temper of the man appear in many instances to be totally changed how can it be supposed that there is anything permanent and inflexible in the propensities of a newborn infant and if not in the character of the disposition how much less in that of the understanding speak the language of truth and reason to your child and be under no apprehension for the result show him that what you recommend is valuable and desirable and fear not but he will desire it convince his understanding and you enlist all his powers animal and intellectual in your service how long has the genius of education been disheartened and unnerved by the pretense that man is born all that it is possible for him to become how long has the jargon imposed upon the world which would persuade us that in instructing a man you do not add to but unfold his stores the miscarriages of education do not proceed from the boundedness of its powers but from the mistakes with which it is accompanied we often inspire disgust where we mean to infuse desire we are wrapped up in ourselves and do not observe as we ought step by step the sensations that pass in the mind of our hearer we mistake compulsion for persuasion and delude ourselves into the belief that despotism is the road to the heart education will proceed with a firm step and with genuine lustre when those who conduct it shall know what a vast field it embraces when they shall be aware that the effect the question whether the pupil shall be a man of perseverance and enterprise or a stupid and inanimate dolt depends upon the powers of those under whose direction he is placed and the skill with which those powers shall be applied industry will be exerted with tenfold alacrity when it shall be generally confessed that there are no obstacles to our improvement which do not yield to the powers of industry multitudes will never exert the energy necessary to extraordinary success till they shall dismiss the prejudices that fetter them get rid of the chilling system of occult and inexplicable causes and consider the human mind as an intelligent agent guided by motives and prospects presented to the understanding and not by causes of which we have no proper cognizance and can form no calculation apply these considerations to the subject of politics and they will authorize us to infer that the excellencies and defects of the human character are not derived from causes beyond the reach of ingenuity to modify and correct if we entertain false views and be involved in pernicious mistakes this disadvantage is not the offspring of an irresistible destiny we have been ignorant we have been hasty or we have been misled remove the causes of this ignorance or this miscalculation and the effects will cease show me in the clearest and most unambiguous manner that a certain mode of proceeding is the most reasonable in itself or most conductive to my interest and i shall infallibly pursue that mode as long as the views you suggested to me continue present to my mind the conduct of human beings in every situation is governed by the judgments they make 
and the sensations that are communicated to them. It has appeared that the characters of men are determined in all their most essential circumstances by education. By education in this place, I would be understood to convey the most comprehensive sense that can possibly be annexed to that word, including every incident that produces an idea in the mind, and can give birth to a train of reflections. It may be of use for a clear understanding of the subject we here examine, to consider education under three heads, the education of accident, or those impressions we receive independently of any design on the part of the preceptor, education commonly so called, or the impressions which he intentionally communicates, and political education, or the modification of our ideas received from the form of government under which we live. In the course of this successive review, we shall be enabled in some degree to ascertain the respective influence which is to be attributed to each. It is not unusual to hear persons dwell with emphasis on the wide difference of the results in two young persons who have been educated together, and this has been produced as a decisive argument in favor of the essential differences we are supposed to bring into the world with us. But this could scarcely have happened but from extreme inattention in the persons who have so argued. Innumerable ideas or changes in the state of the percipient being probably occur in every moment of time. How many of these enter into the plan of the preceptor? Two children walk out together. One busies himself in plucking flowers or running after butterflies. The other walks in the hand of their conductor. Two men view a picture. They never see it from the same point of view, and therefore, strictly speaking, never see the same picture. If they sit down to hear a lecture or any piece of instruction, they never sit down with the same degree of attention, seriousness, or good humor. The previous state of mind is different, and therefore the impression received cannot be the same. It has been found in the history of several eminent men, and probably would have been found much oftener had their juvenile adventures been more accurately recorded, that the most trivial circumstance has sometimes furnished the original occasion of awakening the ardor of their minds in determining the bent of their studies. It may, however, reasonably be suspected whether the education of design be not, intrinsically considered, more powerful than the education of accident. If at any time it appear impotent, this is probably owing to mistake in the project. The instructor continually fails in wisdom of contrivance, or conciliation of manner, or both. It may often happen, either from the pedantry of his habits, or the impatience of his temper, that his recommendation shall operate rather as an antidote than an attraction. Preceptors are apt to pique themselves upon disclosing part and concealing part of the truth, upon a sort of commonplace cant exhortation to be addressed to youth, which it would be an insult to offer to the understandings of men. But children are not inclined to consider him entirely as their friend, whom they detect in an attempt to impose upon them. Were it otherwise, were we sufficiently frank and sufficiently skillful, did we apply ourselves to excite the sympathy of the young, and to gain their confidence? It is not to be believed, but that the systematical measures of the preceptor would have a decisive advantage over the desolatory influence of accidental impression. Children are a sort of raw material put into our hands, a ductile and yielding substance, which, if we do not ultimately mold in conformity to our wishes, it is because we throw away the power committed to us by the folly with which we are accustomed to exert it. But there is another error not less decisive. The object we choose is an improper one. Our labor is expended not in teaching truth, but in teaching falsehood. When that is the case, education is necessarily and happily maimed of half its powers. The success of an attempt to mislead can never be complete. We continually communicate, in spite of ourselves, the materials of just reasoning. Reason is the genuine exercise, and truth the native element of an intellectual nature. 
it is no wonder therefore that with a crude and ab abortive plan to govern his efforts the preceptor is perpetually baffled and the pupil who has been thus stored with systematic delusions and partial obscure and disfigured truths should come out anything rather than that which his instructor intended him it remains to be considered what share political institution and forms of government occupy in the education of every human being their degree of influence depends upon two essential circumstances first it is nearly impossible to oppose the education of the preceptor and the education we derive from the forms of government under which we live to each other and therefore however powerful the former of these may be absolutely considered it can never enter the lists with the latter upon equal terms should any one talk to us of rescuing a young person from the sinister influence of corrupt government by the power of education it will be fair to ask who is the preceptor by whom this task is to be effected is he born in the ordinary mode of generation or does he descend among us from the skies has his character been in no degree modified by that very influence he undertakes to counteract it is beyond all controversy that men who live in a state of equality or that approaches equality will be frank ingenuous and intrepid in their carriage while those who inhabit where a great disparity of ranks has prevailed will be distinguished by coldness irresoluteness timidity and caution will the preceptor in question be altogether superior to these qualities which of us is there who utters his thoughts in the fearless and explicit manner that true wisdom would prescribe who that is sufficiently critical and severe does not detect himself every hour in some act of falsehood or equivocation that example and early habits have planted too deeply to be eradicated but the question is not what extraordinary persons can be found who may shine illustrious exceptions to the prevailing degeneracy of their neighbors as long as parents and teachers in general shall fall under the established rule it is clear that politics and modes of government will educate and infect us all they poison our minds before we can resist or so much as suspect their malignity like the barbarous directors of the eastern seraglios they deprive us of our virility and fit us for their despicable employment from the cradle so false is the opinion that has too generally prevailed that politics is an affair with which ordinary men have little concern secondly supposing the preceptor had all the qualifications that can reasonably be imputed let us recollect for a moment what are the influences with which he would have to struggle political institution by the consequences with which it is pregnant strongly suggests to every one who enters within its sphere what is the path he should avoid as well as what he should pursue under a government fundamentally erroneous he will see intrepid virtue proscribed and a servile and corrupt spirit uniformly encouraged but morality itself is nothing but a calculation of consequences what strange confusion will the spectacle of that knavery which is universally practised through all the existing classes of society produce in the mind the preceptor cannot go out of the world or prevent the intercourse of his pupil with human beings of a character different from his own attempts of this kind are generally unhappy stamped with the impression of artifice intolerance and usurpation from earliest infancy therefore there will be two principles contending for empire the peculiar and elevated system of the preceptor and the grovelling views of the great mass of mankind these will generate confusion uncertainty and irresolution at no period of life will the effect correspond to what it would have been if the community were virtuous and wise but its effect obscure and imperceptible for a time may be expected to burst into explosion at the period of puberty when the pupil first becomes master of his own actions and chooses his avocations and his associates he will necessarily be acquainted with many things of which before he had very slender notions at this time the follies of the world 
wear their most alluring face. He can scarcely avoid imagining that he has here to do labor under some species of delusion. Delusions, when detected, causes him upon whom it was practiced to be indignant and restive. The only chance which remains is that, after a time, he should be recalled and awakened, and against this chance there are the progressive enticements of society, sensuality, ambition, sordid interest, false ridicule, and the incessant decay of that unblemished purity which attended him in his outset. The best that can be expected is that he should return at last to sobriety and truth with a mind debilitated and relaxed by repeated errors, and a moral constitution in which the seeds of degeneracy have been deeply and extensively sown. End of section 7 Section 8 of Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones, Benita Springs, Florida. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and its influence on morals and happiness by william godwin book one chapter five part one chapter five the voluntary actions of men originate in their opinions if by the reasons already given we have removed the supposition of any original bias in the mind that is inaccessible to human skill and shown that the defects to which we are now subject are not irrevocably entailed upon us, there is another question of no less importance to be decided, before the ground can appear to be sufficiently cleared for political melioration. There is a doctrine, the advocates of which have not been less numerous than those for innate principles and instincts, teaching that the conduct of human beings in many important particulars is not determined upon any grounds of reasoning and comparison, but by immediate and irresistible impression, in defiance of the conclusions and conviction of the understanding. Man is a compound being, say the favorers of this hypothesis, made up of powers of reasoning and powers of sensation. These two principles are in perpetual hostility, and, as reason will in some cases subdue all the allurements of sense, so there are others in which the headlong impulses of sense will forever defeat the tardy decisions of judgment. He that should attempt to regulate man entirely by his understanding and supersede the irregular influences of material excitement or that should imagine it practicable by any process and in any length of time to reduce the human species under the influence of general truth would show himself profoundly ignorant of some of the first laws of our nature footnote objections have been started to the use of the word truth in this absolute construction as if it implied in the mind of the writer the notion of something having an independent and separate existence, whereas nothing can be more certain than that truth, that is, affirmative and negative propositions, has strictly no existence but in the mind of him who utters or hears it. But these objections seem to have been taken up too hastily. It cannot be denied that there are some propositions which are believed for a time, and afterwards refuted, and others such as the most of the theorems of mathematics and many of those of natural philosophy, respecting which there is no probability that they will ever be refuted. Every subject of inquiry is susceptible to affirmation and negation, and those propositions concerning it which describe the real relations of things may in a certain sense, whether we be or be not aware that they do so, be said to be true. Taken in this sense, truth is immutable. He that speaks of its immutability does nothing more 
and predict with greater or less probability, and say, This is what I believe, and what all reasonable beings, till they shall first fall short of me in their degree of information, will continue to believe. End footnote. This doctrine, which in many cases has passed so current as to be thought scarcely a topic for examination, is highly worthy of a minute analysis. If true, it is no less than the doctrine of innate principles, opposes a bar to the efforts of philanthropy and the improvement of social institutions. Certain it is that our prospects of amelioration depend upon the progress of inquiry and the general advancement of knowledge. If, therefore, there be points, and those important ones, in which, so to express myself, knowledge and the thinking principle in man cannot be brought into contact, if, however great be the improvement of his reason, he will not the less certainly in many cases act in a way irrational and absurd. This consideration must greatly overcloud the prospect of the moral reformer. There is another consequence that will flow from the vulgarly received doctrine upon this subject. If man be, by the very constitution of his nature, the subject of opinion, and if truth and reason, when properly displayed, give us a complete hold upon his choice, then the search of the political inquirer will be much simplified. Then we have only to discover what form of civil society is most conformable to reason, and we may rest assured that, as soon as men shall be persuaded from conviction to adopt that form, they will have acquired to themselves an invaluable benefit. But, if reason be frequently inadequate to its task, if there be an opposite principle in man, resting upon its own ground, and maintaining a separate jurisdiction, the most rational principles of society may be rendered abortive. It may be necessary to call in mere sensible causes to encounter causes of the same nature. Folly may be the fittest instrument to effect the purposes of wisdom, and vice to disseminate and establish the public benefit. In that case, the salutary prejudices and useful delusions, as they have been called, of aristocracy, the glittering diadem, the magnificent canopy, the ribbons, stars, and titles of an illustrious rank, may at last be found the fittest instruments for guiding and alluring to his proper ends the savage man. Such is the nature of the question to be examined and such its connection with the inquiry concerning the influence of political institutions. The more accurately to conceive the topic before us, it is necessary to observe that it relates to the voluntary actions of man. The distinction between voluntary and involuntary action, if properly stated, is exceedingly simple. That action is involuntary, which takes place in us either without foresight on our part or contrary to the full bent of our inclinations. Thus, if a child or person of mature age burst into tears in a matter unexpected or unforeseen by himself, or if he burst into tears, though his pride or any other principle make him exert every effort to restrain them, this action is involuntary. Voluntary action is where the event is foreseen previously to its occurrence, and the hope or fear of that event forms the excitement, or, as it is most frequently termed, the motive, inducing us, if hope be the passion, to endeavor to forward, and if fear, to endeavor to prevent it. It is this motion, this manner generated to which we annex the idea of voluntariness. Let it be observed, that the word action is here used in the sense of natural philosophers as descriptive of a change taking place in any part of the universe without entering into the question whether that change be necessary or free. Now let us consider what are the inferences that immediately result from the above simple and unquestionable explanation of voluntary action. 
voluntary action is accompanied with foresight the hope or fear of a certain event is its motive but foresight is not an affair of simple immediate impulse it implies a series of observations so extensive as to enable us from like antecedents to infer like consequence voluntary action is occasioned by the idea of consequences to result wine is set before me and i fill my glass i do this either because i foresee that the flavor will be agreeable to my palate or that its effect will be to produce gaiety and exhilaration or that my drinking it will prove the kindness and good humor i feel towards the company with which i am engaged if in any case my action in filling dwindle into mechanical and semi-mechanical done with little or no adverting of the mind to its performance it so far becomes an involuntary action but if every voluntary action be performed for the sake of its consequences then in every voluntary action there is comparison and judgment every such action proceeds upon the apprehended truth of some proposition the mind decides this is good or desirable and immediately upon that decision if accompanied with a persuasion that we are competent to accomplish this good or desirable things the limbs proceed to their office the mind decides this is better than something else either wine or cordials are before me and i choose the wine rather than the cordials or why the wine is only presented or thought of and i decide that to take the wine is better than to abstain from it thus it appears that in every voluntary action there is preference or choice which indeed are synonymous terms this full elucidation of the nature of voluntary action enables us to proceed a step further hence it appears that the voluntary actions of men in all cases originate in their opinions the actions of men it will readily be admitted originate in the state of their minds immediately previous to those actions actions therefore which are preceded by a judgment this is good or this is desirable originate in the state of judgment or opinion upon that subject it may happen that the opinion may be exceedingly fugitive it may have been preceded by aversion and followed by remorse but it was unquestionably the opinion of the mind at the instant in which the action commenced it is by no means uninstructive to remark how those persons who seem most to have discarded the use of their reason have frequently fallen by accident as it were upon important truths there has been a set of christians who taught that the only point which was to determine the future everlasting happiness or misery of mankind was their faith being pressed with the shocking immorality of their doctrine and the cruel and tyrannical character it imputed to the author of the universe some of the most ingenious of them have explain themselves thus quote, man is made up of two parts his internal sentiments and his external conduct between these two there is a close and indissoluble connection as are his sentiments so is his conduct faith that faith which alone entitles to salvation is indeed a man's opinion but not every opinion he may happen openly to profess not every opinion which floats idly in his brain and is only recollected when he is gravely questioned upon the subject faith is the opinion that is always present to the mind that lives in the memory or at least infallibly suggests itself when any article of conduct is considered with which it is materially connected faith is that strong permanent and lively persuasion of the understanding with which no delusive temptations will ever be able successfully to contend faith modifies the conduct gives a new direction to the dispositions and renders the whole character pure and heavenly but heavenly dispositions only can fit a man for the enjoyment of heaven heaven in reality is not so properly a place as a state of the mind 
and if a wicked man could be introduced into the society of saints made perfect he would be miserable god therefore when he requires faith alone as a qualification for heaven is so far from being arbitrary that he merely executes the laws of reason and does the only thing it was possible for him to do in this system there are enormous absurdities but the view it exhibits of the source of voluntary action sufficiently corresponds with the analysis we have given the subject the author of the characteristics has illustrated this branch of the nature of man in a very masterly manner he observes quote, there are few who think always consistently or according to one certain hypothesis upon any subject so abstruse and intricate as the cause of all things and the economy or government of the universe for it is evident in the case of the most devout people even by their own confession that there are times when their faith hardly can support them in the belief of a supreme wisdom and that they are often tempted to judge disadvantageously of a providence and just administration in the whole that alone therefore is to be called a man's opinion which is of any other the most habitual to him and occurs upon most occasions so that it is hard to pronounce certainly of any man that he is an atheist because unless his whole thoughts are at all seasons and on all occasions steadily bent against all supposition or imagination of design in things he is no perfect atheist in the same manner if a man's thoughts are not at all times steady and resolute against all imagination of chance fortune or ill design in things he is no perfect theist but if any one believes more of chance and confusion than of design he is to be esteemed more an atheist than a theist this is surely not a very accurate or liberal view of the atheistical system from that which most predominates or has the ascendant and in case he believes more of the prevalency of an ill-designing principle than of a good one he is rather a demonist and may be justly so called from the side to which the balance of his judgment most inclines from this view of the subject we shall easily be led to perceive how little the fact of the variableness and inconstancy of human conduct is compatible with the principle here delivered that the voluntary actions of men in all cases originate in their opinions the persuasion that exists in the mind of the drunkard in committing his first act of intoxication that in so doing he complies with the most cogent and irresistible reasons capable of being assigned upon the subject may be exceedingly temporary but it is the clear and unequivocal persuasion of his mind at the moment that he determines upon the action the thoughts of the murderer will frequently be in a state of the most tempestuous fluctuation he may make and unmake his diabolical purpose fifty times in an hour his mind may be torn a thousand ways by terror and fury malignity and remorse but whenever his resolution is formed it is formed upon the suggestions of the rational faculty and when he ultimately works up his mind to the perpetration he is then most strongly impressed with the superior recommendations of the conduct he pursues one of the fallacies by which we are most frequently induced to a conduct which our habitual judgment disapproves is that our attention becomes so engrossed by a particular view of the subject as wholly to forget for the moment those considerations which at other times were accustomed to determine our opinion in such cases it frequently happens that the neglected consideration recurs the instant the hurry of action has subsided and we stand astonished at our own infatuation and folly this reasoning however clear and irresistible it may appear is yet exposed to one very striking objection according to the ideas here delivered men always proceed in their voluntary actions upon judgments extant to their understanding 
such judgments must be attended with consciousness and were this hypothesis a sound one nothing could be more easy than for a man in all cases to assign the precise reason that induced him to any particular action the human mind would then be a very simple machine always aware of the grounds upon which it proceeded and self-deception would be impossible but this statement is completely in opposition to experience and history ask a man the reason why he puts on his clothes why he eats his dinner or performs any other ordinary action of his life he immediately hesitates endeavors to recollect himself and often assigns a reason the most remote from what the true philosophy of motive would have led us to expect nothing is more clear than that the moving cause of this action was not expressly present to his apprehension at the time he performed it self-deception is so far from impossible that it is one of the most ordinary phenomena with which we are acquainted nothing is more usual than for a man to impute his actions to honourable motives when it is nearly demonstrable that they flowed from some corrupt and contemptible source on the other hand many persons suppose themselves to be worse than an impartial spectator will find any good reason to believe them a penetrating observer will frequently be able to convince his neighbor that upon such an occasion he was actuated by the motives very different from what he imagined philosophers to this hour dispute whether human beings in their most virtuous exertions are under the power of disinterested benevolence or merely of an enlightened self-interest here then we are presented in one or other of these sets of philosophers with a striking instance of men's acting from motives diametrically opposite to those which they suppose to be the guides of their conduct self-examination is to a proverb one of the most arduous of these tasks which true virtue imposes are not these facts in express contradiction to the doctrine that the voluntary actions of men in all cases originate in the judgments of the understanding undoubtedly the facts which have been here enumerated appear to be strictly true to determine how far they affect the doctrine of the present chapter it is necessary to return to our analysis of the phenomena of the human mind hitherto we have considered the actions of human beings only under two classes voluntary and involuntary in strictness however there is a third class which belongs to neither yet partakes of the nature of both we have already defined voluntary action to be that of which certain consequences foreseen and considered either as objects of desire or aversion are the motive foresight and volition are inseparable but what is foreseen must by the very terms be present to the understanding every action therefore so far as it is perfectly voluntary flows solely from the decision of the judgment but the actions above cited such as relate to our garments and our food are only imperfectly voluntary in respect to volition there appear to be two stages in the history of the human mind foresight is the result of experience therefore foresight and by parity of reasoning volition cannot enter into the earliest actions of a human being as soon however as the infant perceives the connection between certain attitudes and gestures and the circumstance of receiving suck for example he is brought to desire those preliminaries for the sake of that result here so far as it relates to volition and the judgment of the understanding the action is as simple as can well be imagined yet even in this instance the motive may be said to be complex habit or custom has its share this habit is founded in actions originally involuntary and mechanical and modifies after various methods such of our actions as are voluntary but there are habits of a second sort 
in proportion as our experience enlarges the subjects of voluntary action become more numerous in this state of the human being he soon comes to perceive a considerable similarity between situation and situation in consequence he feels inclined to abridge the process of deliberation and to act to-day conformably to the determination of yesterday thus the understanding fixes for itself resting places is no longer a novice and is not at the trouble continually to go back and revise the original reasons which determined it to be a course of action thus the man acquires habits from which it is very difficult to wean him and which he obeys without being able to assign either to himself or to others any explicit reason for this proceeding this is the history of prepossession and prejudice let us consider how much there is of voluntary and how much of involuntary in this species of action let the instance be of a man going to church to-day he has been accustomed suppose to a certain routine of this kind from his childhood most undoubtedly then in performing this action to-day his motive does not singly consist of inducements present to his understanding this distribution is in substance the same as that of hartley but is here introduced without any intention to adopt the peculiarities of his phraseology his feelings are not of the same nature as those of a man who would be persuaded by a train of reasoning to perform that function for the first time in his life his case is partly similar to that of a scholar who has gone through a course of geometry and who now believes the truth of the propositions upon the testimony of his memory though the proofs are by no means present in his understanding thus the person in question is partly induced to go to church by reasons which once appeared sufficient to his understanding and the effects of which remain though the reasons are now forgotten or at least not continually recollected he goes partly for the sake of decorum character and to secure the good will of his neighbours a part of his inducement also perhaps is that his parents accustomed him to go to church at first from the mere force of authority and that the omission of a habit to which we have been formed is apt to sit awkwardly and uneasily upon the human mind thus it happens that a man who should scrupulously examine his own conduct in going to church would find great difficulty in satisfying his mind as to the precise motive or proportion contributed by different motives which maintain his adherence to that practice it is probable however that when he goes to church he determines that his action is right proper or expedient referring for the reasons which prove this rectitude or expediency to the complex impression which remains in his mind from the inducements that at different times inclined him to that practice it is still more reasonable to believe that when he sets out there is an express volition foresight or apprehended motive inducing him to that particular action and that he proceeds in such a direction because he knows it leads to the church now so much of this action as proceeds from actually existing foresight and apprehended motive it is proper to call perfectly voluntary so much as proceeds upon a motive out of sight and the operation of which depends upon habit is imperfectly voluntary this sort of habit however must be admitted to retain something of the nature of voluntariness for two reasons first it proceeds upon judgment or apprehended motives though the reasons of that judgment be out of sight and forgotten at the time the individual performed the first action of the kind his proceeding was perfectly voluntary secondly the custom of language authorizes us in denominating every action as in some degree voluntary which a volition foresight or apprehended motive in a contrary direction might have prevented from taking place perhaps no action of a man arrived at years of maturity 
is, in the sense above defined, perfectly voluntary. As there is no demonstration in the higher branches of the mathematics which contains the whole of its proof within itself, and does not depend upon former propositions, the proofs of which are not present to the mind of the learner. The subtlety of the human mind in this respect is incredible. Many single actions, if carefully analyzed and traced to their remotest source, would be found to be the complex result of different motives, to the amount perhaps of some hundreds. In the meantime, it is obvious to remark that the perfection of the human character consists in approaching as nearly as possible to the perfectly voluntary state. We ought to be, upon all occasions, prepared to render a reason for our actions. We should remove ourselves to the furthest distance from the state of mere inanimate machines, acted upon by causes of which they have no understanding. We should be cautious of thinking it a sufficient reason for an action that we are accustomed to performing it, and that we once thought it right. The human understanding has so powerful a tendency to improvement that it is more than probable that, in many instances, the arguments which once appeared to us sufficient would, upon re-examination, appear inadequate and futile. We should, therefore, subject them to perpetual revisal. In our speculative opinions and our practical principles, we should never consider the book of inquiry as shut. We should accustom ourselves not to forget the reasons that produced our determination, but be ready upon all occasions clearly to announce and fully to enumerate them. Having thus explained the nature of human actions, involuntary, imperfectly voluntary, and voluntary, let us consider how far this explanation affects the doctrine of the present chapter. Now it should seem that the great practical political principle remains as entire as ever. Still, volition and foresight in their strict and accurate construction are inseparable. All the most important occasions of our lives are capable of being subjected at pleasure to a decision, as nearly as possible, perfectly voluntary. Still, it remains true that when the understanding clearly perceives rectitude, propriety, and eligibility to belong to a certain conduct, and so long as it has that perception, that conduct will infallibly be adopted. A perception of truth will inevitably be produced by a clear evidence brought home to the understanding, and the constancy of the perception will be proportioned to the apprehended value of the thing perceived. Reason, therefore, and conviction still appear to be the proper instrument, and the sufficient instrument for regulating the actions of mankind. Having sufficiently established the principle that in all cases of volition we act not from impulse but opinion, there is a further obstacle to be removed before this reasoning can be usefully applied to the subject of political melioration. It may be objected, by a person who should admit the force of the above arguments, that little was gained by this exposition to the cause it was intended to promote. Whether or no the actions of men frequently arise, as some authors have asserted, from immediate impression, it cannot, however, be denied that the perturbations of sense frequently seduce the judgment, and that the ideas and temporary notions they produce are too strong for any force that can be brought against them. But what man is now, in this respect, he will always, to a certain degree, remain. He will always have senses, and in spite of all the attempts which can be made to mortify them, their pleasures will always be accompanied with irritation and allurement. Hence it appears that all ideas of vast and extraordinary improvement in man are visionary, that he will always remain in some degree the dupe of illusion, and that reason and absolute impartial truth can never hope to possess him entire. The first observation that suggests itself upon this statement is that the points already established 
tend in some degree to set this new question in a clearer light. From them it may now be inferred that the contending forces of reason and sense in the power they exercise over our conduct at least pass through the same medium and assume the same form. It is opinion contending with opinion and judgment with judgment and this consideration is not unattended with encouragement. When we discourse of the comparative powers of appetite and reason, we speak of those actions which have the consent of the mind and partake of the nature of voluntary. The question neither is nor deserves to be respecting cases where no choice is exerted and no preference shown. Every man is aware that the cases into which volition enters, either for a part or the whole, are sufficiently numerous to decide upon all that is most important in the events of our life. It follows, therefore, in the contention of sense and reason, it cannot be improbable to hope that the opinion which is intrinsically the best founded shall ultimately prevail. But let us examine a little minutely these pleasures of sense the attractions of which are supposed to be so irresistible. In reality, they are no way enabled to maintain their hold upon us, but by means of the assiduous of ornaments with which they are assiduously connected. Reduce them to their true nakedness, and they would be generally despised. Where, almost, is the man who would sit down with impatient eagerness to the most splendid feast the most exquisite viands and highly flavored wines, taste after taste, upheld with kindliest change, if he must sit down alone, and it were not relieved and assisted by the more exalted charms of society, conversation, and mutual benevolence, strip the commerce of the sexes of all its attendant circumstances, and the effect would be similar. Tell a man that all women, so far as sense is concerned, are nearly alike. Bid him, therefore, take a partner without any attention to the symmetry of her person, her vivacity, the voluptuous softness of her temper, the affectionate kindness of her feelings, her imagination, or her wit. You would probably instantly convince him that the commerce itself, which by superficial observers is put for the whole, is the least important branch of the complicated consideration to which it belongs. It is probable that he who should form himself with the greatest care upon a system of solitary sensualism would come at last to a decision not very different from that which Epicurus is said to have adopted in favor of fresh herbs and water from the spring. Let it be confessed that the pleasures of sense are unimportant and trivial. It is next to be asked whether, trifling as they are, they may not, nevertheless, possess a delusive and treacherous power by means of which they may often be enabled to overcome every opposition. The better to determine this question, let us suppose a man to be engaged in the progressive voluptuousness of the most sensual scene. Here, if ever, we may expect sensation to be triumphant. Passion is, in this case, in its full career. He impatiently shuts out every consideration that may disturb his enjoyment. Moral views and dissuasives can no longer obtrude themselves into his mind. He resigns himself, without power of resistance, to his predominant idea. Alas, in this situation, nothing is so easy as to extinguish his sensuality. Tell him at this moment that his father is dead, or that he has lost or gained a considerable sum of money, or even perhaps that his favorite horse is stolen from the meadow, and his whole passion shall be instantly annihilated. So vast is the power of which a mere proposition possesses over the mind of man. So conscious are we of the precariousness of the fascination of the senses that upon such occasions we provide against the slightest interruption. If our little finger ached, 
we might probably immediately bid adieu to the empire of this supposed almighty power it is said to be an experiment successfully made by sailors and persons in that class of society to lay a wager with their comrades that the sexual intercourse shall not take place between them and their bedfellow the ensuing night and to trust to their veracity for a confession of the event the only means probably by which any man ever succeeds in indulging the pleasures of sense in contradiction to the habitual persuasions of his judgment is by contriving to forget everything that can be offered against them if notwithstanding all his endeavours the unwished for idea intrudes the indulgence instantly becomes impossible it is to be supposed that the power of sensual allurement which must be carefully kept alive and which the slightest accident overthrows can be invincible only to the artillery of reason and that the most irresistible considerations of justice interest and happiness will never be able habitually to control it to consider this subject in another point of view it seems to be a strange absurdity to hear men assert that the attractions of sensual pleasure are unresistible in contradiction to the multiplied experience of all ages and countries are all good stories of our nature false did no man ever resist a temptation on the contrary have not all the considerations which have power over our hopes our fears or our weaknesses been in competition with a firm and manly virtue employed in vain but what has been done may be done again what has been done by individuals cannot be impossible in a widely different state of society to be done by the whole species the system we are here combating of the irresistible power of sensual allurements has been numerously supported and a variety of arguments has been adduced in its behalf among other things it has been remarked that as the human mind has no innate and original principles so all the information it has is derived from sensation and everything that passes within it is either direct impression upon our external organs or the substance of such impressions modified and refined through certain intellectual strainers and alembics it is therefore reasonable to conclude that the original substance would be most powerful in its properties and the pleasures of external sense more genuine than any other pleasure every sensation is by its very nature accompanied with the idea of pleasure or pain in a vigorous or feeble degree the only thing which can or ought to excite desire is happiness or agreeable sensation it is impossible that the hand can be stretched out to obtain anything except so far as it is considered as desirable and to be desirable is the same thing as to have a tendency to communicate pleasure thus after all the complexities of philosophy are brought back to the simple and irresistible proposition that man is an animal purely sensual hence it follows that in all his transactions much must depend upon immediate impression and little is to be attributed to the generalities of ratiocination end of section eight section nine of inquiry concerning political justice and its influence on morals and happiness this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones, Bonita Springs, Florida. Inquiry Concerning Political Justice and Its Influence on Morals and Happiness by William Godwin. Book 1, Chapter 5, Part 2. All the premises in the objection here stated are unquestionably true man is just such an animal as the objection 
describes. Everything within him that has a tendency to voluntary action is an affair of external or internal sense and has relation to pleasure or pain. But it does not follow from hence that the pleasures of our external organs are more exquisite than any other pleasures. It is by no means unexampled for the result of a combination of materials to be more excellent than the materials themselves. Let us consider the materials by means of which an admirable poem, or, if you will, the author of an admirable poem, is constructed. And we shall immediately acknowledge this to be the case. In reality, the pleasures of a savage, or which is much the same, of a brute are feeble indeed compared with those of the man of civilization and refinement our sensual pleasures commonly so called would be almost universally despised had we not the art to combine them with the pleasures of intellect and cultivation no man ever performed an act of exalted benevolence without having sufficient reason to know at least so long as the sensation was present to his mind, that all the gratifications of appetite were contemptible in the comparison. That which gives the last zest to our enjoyments is the approbation of our own minds, the consciousness that the exertion we have made was such as was called for by impartial justice and reason. And this consciousness will be clear and satisfying in proportion as our decision in that respect is unmixed with error our perceptions can never be so luminous and accurate in the belief of falsehood as of truth the great advantage possessed by the allurements of sense is quote, that the ideas suggested by them are definite and precise while those which deal in generalities are apt to be faint and obscure the difference is like that between things absent and things present of the recommendations possessed by the latter we have a more vivid perception and seem to have a better assurance of the probability of their attainment these circumstances must necessarily in the comparison instituted by the mind in all similar cases to a certain degree incline the balance towards that side add to which that what is present forces itself upon our attention while that which is absent depends for its recurrence upon the capriciousness of memory but these advantages are seen upon the very face of them to be of a precarious nature if my idea of virtue benevolence and justice or whatever it is that ought to restrain me from an improper leaning to the pleasures of sense be now less definite and precise they may be gradually and unlimitedly improved if i do not now sufficiently perceive all the recommendations they possess and their clear superiority over the allurements of sense there is surely no natural impossibility in my being made to understand a distinct proposition or in my being fully convinced by an unanswerable argument as to recollection that is certainly a faculty of the mind which is capable of improvement and the point of which i have been once intimately convinced and have had a lively and profound impression will not easily be forgotten when the period of action shall arrive it has been said quote, that a rainy day will frequently convert a man of valor into a coward Close quote. if that should be the case there is no presumption in affirming that his courage was produced by very slight and inadequate motives how long would a sensation of this kind be able to hold out against the idea of the benefits to arise from his valor safety to his family and children defeat to an unjust and formidable assailant and freedom and felicity to be secured to his country in reality 
the atmosphere instead of considerably affecting the mass of mankind affects in an eminent degree only a small part of that mass the majority are either above or below it are neither too gross to feel strongly these minute variations or too busy to attend to them the case is to a considerable degree the same with the rest of our animal sensations in digestion it has been said perhaps a fit of the toothache renders a man incapable of strong thinking and spirited exertion how far would they be able to maintain their ground against an unexpected piece of intelligence of the most delightful nature pain is probably more formidable in its attack upon us and more exquisitely felt than any species of bodily pleasure yet all history affords us examples where pain has been contemned and defined by the energies of intellectual resolution do we not read of mutius scaevola who suffered his hand to be destroyed by fire without betraying any symptom of emotion and archbishop Cramer, who endured the same trial two hundred years ago in our own country is it not recorded of anaraxis that while suffering the most excruciating tortures he exclaimed beat on tyrant thou mayst destroy the shell of anaraxarchus but thou canst not touch anaxarsus himself Close quote. the very savage indians sing amidst the wanton tortures that are inflicted on them and tauntingly provoke their tormentors to more ingenious cruelty when we read such stories we recognize in them the genuine characteristics of man man is not a vegetable to be governed by sensations of heat and cold dryness and moisture he is a reasonable creature capable of perceiving what is eligible and right of fixing indelibly certain principles upon his mind and adhering inflexibly to the resolutions he has made let us attend for a moment to the general result of the preceding discussions the tendency of the whole is to ascertain an important principle in the science of the human mind if the arguments here adduced be admitted to be valid it is necessarily follows that whatever can be adequately brought home to the conviction of the understanding may be depended upon as affording a secure hold upon the conduct we are no longer at liberty to consider man as divided between two independent principles or imagine that his inclinations are in any way inaccessible through the medium of his reason we find the thinking principle within us to be uniform and simple in consequence of which we are entitled to conclude that it is in every respect the proper subject of education and persuasion and is susceptible of unlimited improvement there is no conduct in itself reasonable which the refutation of error and dissipating of uncertainty will not make appear to be such there is no conduct which can be shown to be reasonable the reasons of which may not sooner or later be made impressive irresistible and matter of habitual recollection lastly there is no conduct the reasons of which are thus conclusive and thus communicated which will not infallibly and uniformly be adopted by the man to whom they are communicated it may not be improper to attend a little to the light which may be derived from these speculations upon certain maxims almost universally received but which as they convey no distinct ideas may be productive of mischief and can scarcely be productive of good the first of these is that the passions ought to be purified but not to be eradicated another conveying nearly the same lesson but in different words is that passion is not to be conquered by reason but by bringing some other passion into contention with it 
the word passion is a term extremely vague in its signification it is used principally in three senses it either represents the ardor and vehemence of mind with which any object is pursued or secondly the temporary persuasion of excellence and desirableness which accompanies any action performed by us contrary to our more customary and usual habits of thinking or lastly those external modes or necessities to which the whole human species is alike subject such as hunger the passion between the sexes and others in which of these senses is the word to be understood in the maxims above stated in the first sense it has sufficiently appeared that none of our sensations or which is the same thing none of our ideas are unaccompanied with a consciousness of pleasure or pain consequently all of our volitions are attended with complacence or aversion in this sense without doubt passion cannot be eradicated but in this sense also passion is so far from being incompatible with reason that it is inseparable from it virtue sincerity justice and all those principles which are begotten and cherished in us by due exercise of reason will never be very strenuously espoused till they are ardently loved that is till their value is clearly perceived and adequately understood in this sense nothing is necessary but to show us that a thing is truly good and worthy to be desired in order to excite in us a passion for its attainment if therefore this be the meaning of passion in the above proposition it is true that passion ought not to be eradicated but it is equally true that it cannot be eradicated it is true that the only way to conquer one passion is by the introduction of another but it is equally true that if we employ our rational faculties we cannot fail of thus conquering our erroneous propensities the maxims therefore are nugatory in the second sense our passions are ambition avarice the love of power the love of fame envy revenge and innumerable others miserable indeed would be our condition if we could only expel one bad passion by another of the same kind and there is no way of rooting out delusion from the mind but by substituting another delusion in its place but it has been demonstrated at large that this is not the case truth is not less powerful or less friendly exertion than error and needs not fear its encounter falsehood is not as such a principle would suppose in which the human mind can exist so that if the space which the mind occupies be too much rarefied and cleared its existence or health will be in some degree injured on the contrary we need not fear any sinister consequences from the subversion of error and introducing as much truth into the mind as we can possibly accumulate all those notions by which we are accustomed to ascribe to anything a value which is does not really possess should be eradicated without mercy and truth a sound and just estimate of things which is not less favorable to zeal or activity should be earnestly and incessantly cultivated in the third sense of the word passion as it describes the result of those circumstances which are common to the whole species such as hunger and the propensity to the intercourse of the sexes it seems sufficiently reasonable to say that no attempt ought to be made to eradicate them but this sentiment was hardly worth the formality of a maxim so far as these propensities ought to be conquered or restrained there is no reason why this should not be effected by the due exercise of the understanding for these illustrations it is sufficiently apparent that the care recommended to us not to extinguish or seek to extinguish our passions 
is founded in a confused or mistaken view of the subject another maxim not inferior in reputation to those above recited is that of the following nature when the term nature here is still more loose and unintelligible than the term passion was before if it to be meant that we ought to accommodate ourselves to hunger and the other appetites which are common to our species this is probably true but these appetites some of them in particular lead to excess and the mischief with which they are pregnant is to be corrected not by consulting our appetites but our reason if it be meant that we should follow instinct it has been proved that we have no instincts the advocates of this maxim are apt to consider whatever now exists among mankind as inherent and perpetual and to conclude that this is to be maintained not in proportion as it can be shown to be reasonable but because it is natural thus it has been said that man is naturally a religious animal and for this reason and not in proportion to our power of demonstrating the being of a god or the truth of christianity religion is to be maintained thus again it has been called natural that men should form themselves into immense tribes or nations and go to war with each other thus persons of narrow views and observations regard everything as natural and right that happens however capriciously or for however short a time in which they live the only things which can be said to compose the nature or constitution of man are our external structure which itself is capable of being modified with indefinite variety the appetites and impressions growing out of that structure and the capacity of combining ideas and inferring conclusions the appetites common to the species we cannot wholly destroy the faculty of reason it would be absurd systematically to counteract since it is only by some sort of reasoning bad or good that we can so much as adopt any system in this sense therefore no doubt we ought to follow nature that is to employ our understandings and increase our discernment but by conforming ourselves to the principles of our constitution in this respect we most effectively exclude all following or implicit assent if we would fully comport ourselves in a manner correspondent to our properties and powers we must bring everything to the standard of reason nothing must be admitted either as principle or precept that will not support this trial nothing must be sustained because it is ancient because we have been accustomed to regard it as sacred or because it has been unusual to bring its validity into question finally if by following nature be understood that we must fix our preference upon things that will conduce to human happiness in this there is some truth but the truth it contains is extremely darkened by the phraseology in which it is couched we must consider our external structure so far as relates to the mere question of our preservation as to the rest whatever will make a reasonable nature happy will make us happy and our preference ought to be bestowed upon that species of pleasure which has most independence and most animation the corollaries respecting political truth deducible from the simple proposition which seems clearly established by the reasonings of the present chapter that the voluntary actions of men in all instances conformable to the deductions of their understanding are of the highest importance hence we may infer what are the hopes and prospects of human improvement the doctrine which may be founded upon these principles may perhaps best be expressed in the five following propositions sound reasoning and truth when adequately communicated must always be victorious over error 
sound reasoning and truth are capable of being so communicated truth is omnipotent the vices and moral weakness of man are not invincible man is perfectible or in other words susceptible of perpetual improvement these propositions will be found in part synonymous with each other the time of the inquirer will not be unprofitably spent in copious clearing up of the foundations of moral and political systems it is extremely beneficial that truth should be viewed on all sides and examined under different aspects the propositions are even little more than so many different modes of stating the principal topic of this chapter but if they will not admit each of a distinct train of arguments in its support it may not however be useless to bestow upon each a short illustration the first of these propositions is so evident that it needs only be stated in order to the being universally admitted is there any one who can imagine that when sound argument and sophistry are fairly brought into comparison the victory can be doubtful sophistry may assume a plausible appearance and contrive to a certain extent to bewilder the understanding but it is one of the prerogatives of truth to follow it in its mazes and strip it of disguise nor does any difficulty from this consideration interfere with the establishment of the present proposition we suppose truth not merely to be exhibited but adequately communicated that is in other words distinctly apprehended by the person to whom it is being addressed in this case the victory is too small to admit of being controverted by the most inveterate scepticism the second proposition is that sound reasoning and truth are capable of being adequately communicated by one man to another this proposition may be understood of such communication either as it affects the individual or the species first of the individual in order to its due application in this point of view opportunity for the communication must necessarily be supposed the incapacity of human intellect at present requires that this opportunity should be of long duration or repeated occurrence we do not always know how to communicate all the evidence we are capable of communicating in a single conversation and much less in a single instant but if the communicator be sufficiently master of his subject and if the truth be altogether on his side he must ultimately succeed in his undertaking we suppose him to have sufficient urbanity to conciliate the good will and sufficient energy to engage the attention of the party concerned in that case there is no prejudice no blind reverence for established systems no false fear of the interference to be drawn that can resist him he will encounter those one after the other and he will encounter them with success our prejudices our undue reverence and imaginary fears flow out of some views the mind has been induced to entertain they are founded in the belief of some propositions but every one of these propositions is capable of being refuted the champion we describe proceeds from point to point if in any his success have been doubtful that he will retrace and put out of the reach of mistake and it is evidently impossible that with such qualifications and such perseverance he should not ultimately accomplish his purpose such is the appearance which this proposition assumes when examined in a loose and practical view in strict consideration it will not admit of debate man is a rational being if there be any man who is incapable of making inferences for himself or of understanding when stated in the most explicit terms the inferences of another him we consider as an abortive production and not in strictness belonging to the human species 
it is absurd therefore to say that sound reasoning and truth cannot be communicated by one man to another whether in any case he fails it is that he is not sufficiently laborious patient and clear we suppose of course the person also undertakes to communicate the truth really to possess it and be master of his subject for it is scarcely worth an observation to say that that which he has not himself he cannot communicate to another if truth therefore can be brought home to the conviction of the individual let us see how it stands with the public or the world now in the first place it is extremely clear that if no individual can resist the force of truth it can be only necessary to apply this proposition from individual to individual and we shall at length comprehend the whole thus the affirmation in its literal sense is completely established with respect to the chance of success this will depend first upon the precluding all extraordinary convulsions of nature and after this upon the activity and energy of those to whose hands the sacred cause of truth may be entrusted it is apparent that if justice be done to its merits it includes in it the indestructible germ of ultimate victory every new convert that is made to its cause if he be taught its excellence as well as its reality is a fresh apostle to extend its illuminations through a wider sphere in this respect it resembles the motion of a falling body which increases its rapidity in proportion to the squares of the distances add to which that when a convert to truth has been adequately informed it is barely possible that he should ever fail in his adherence whereas error contains in it the principle of its own originality thus the advocates of falsehood and mistake must continually diminish and the well-informed adherence of truth incessantly multiply it has sometimes been affirmed that whenever a question is ably brought forward for examination the decision of the human species must ultimately be on the right side but this proposition is to be understood with allowances civil policy magnificent emoluments and sinister motives may upon many occasions by distracting the attention cause the worse reason to pass as if it were the better it is not absolutely certain that in the controversy brought forward by clark and whiston against the doctrine of the trinity or by collins and woolston against the christian revelation the innovators had altogether the worst of the argument yet fifty years after the agitation of these controversies their effects can scarcely be traced and things appeared on all sides as if the controversies had never existed perhaps it will be said that though the effects of truth may be obscure for a time they will break out in the sequel with double lustre but this at least depends upon circumstances no comet must come in meantime and sweep away the human species no attila must have it in his power once again to lead back the flood of barbarism to deluge the civilized world and the disciples or at least the books of the original champions must remain or their discoveries and demonstrations must be nearly lost to the world the third of the propositions enumerated is that truth is omnipotent this proposition which is convenient for its brevity must be understood with limitations it would be absurd to affirm that truth unaccompanied by the evidence which proves it to be such or when that evidence is partially and imperfectly stated has any such property but it has sufficiently appeared from the arguments already adduced that truth when adequately communicated is so far as relates to the conviction of the understanding irresistible there may indeed be propositions which though true in themselves 
may be beyond the sphere of human knowledge, or respecting which the human beings have not yet discovered sufficient arguments for their support. In that case, though true themselves, they are not truths to us. The reasoning by which they are attempted to be established is not sound reasoning. It may perhaps be found that the human mind is not capable of arriving at absolute certainty upon any subject of inquiry. And it must be admitted that human science is attended with all degrees of certainty, from his highest moral evidence to the slightest balance of probability. But human beings are capable of apprehending and weighing all these degrees, and to know the exact quantity of probability which I ought to describe to any proposition may be said to be in one sense the possessing certain knowledge. It would further be absurd if we regard truth in relation to its empire over our conduct to suppose that it is not limited in its operations by the faculties of our frame. It may be compared to a connoisseur who, however consummate be his talents, can extract from a given instrument only such tones as that instrument will afford but within those limits the deduction which forms the principal substance of this chapter proves to us that whatever is brought home to the conviction of the understanding so long as it is present to the mind possesses an undisputed empire over the conduct nor will he who is sufficiently conversant with the science of intellect be hasty in assigning the bounds of our capacity there are some things which the structure of our bodies will render us forever unable to effect. But in many cases, the lines which appear to prescribe a term to our efforts will, like the mists that arise from a lake, retire further and further, the more closely we endeavor to approach them. Fourthly, the vices and moral weakness of man are not invincible. This is the proceeding proposition with a very slight variation in the statement. Vice and weakness are formed upon ignorance and error. But truth is more powerful than any champion that can be brought into the field against it. Consequently, truth has the faculty of expelling the weakness and vice and placing nobler and more beneficent principles in their stead lastly man is perfectible this proposition needs some explanation by perfectible it is not meant that he is capable of being brought to perfection but the word seems sufficiently adapted to express the faculty of being continually made better and receiving perpetual improvement and in this sense it is here to be understood the term perfectible, thus explained, not only does not imply the capacity of being brought to perfection, but stands in express opposition to it. If we could arrive at perfection, there would be an end to our improvement. There is, however, one thing of great importance that it does imply. Every perfection or excellence that human beings are competent to conceive human beings unless in cases that are palpably and unequivocally excluded by the structure of the frame are competent to attain this is an inference which immediately follows from the omnipotence of truth every truth that is capable of being communicated is capable of being brought home to the conviction of the mind every principle which can be brought home to the conviction of the mind will infallibly produce a correspondent effect upon the conduct if there were not something in the nature of man incompatible with absolute perfection the doctrine of the omnipotence of truth would afford no small probability that he would one day reach it why is the perfection of man impossible the idea of absolute perfection is scarcely within the grasp of human understanding. If science were more familiarized to speculations 
of this sort, we should perhaps discover that the notion itself was pregnant with absurdity and contradiction. It is not necessary in this argument to dwell upon the limited nature of the human faculties. We can neither be present to all places nor to all times. We cannot penetrate into the essences of things, or rather we have no sound or satisfactory knowledge of things external to ourselves, but merely of our own sensations. We cannot discover the causes of things, or ascertain that in the antecedent which connects it with the consequent, and discern nothing but their contiguity. With what pretense can it be that thus shut in on all sides lay claim to absolute perfection? But, not to insist upon these considerations, there is one principle in the human mind which must forever exclude us from arriving at a close of our acquisitions and confine us to perpetual progress. The human, so far as we are acquainted with it, is nothing else but a faculty of perception. All our knowledge, all our ideas, everything we possess as intelligent beings comes from impression. All the minds that exist set out from absolute ignorance. They received first one impression and then a second. As the impressions became more numerous and were stored by the help of memory and combined by the faculty of association, so the experience increased, and with the experience, the knowledge. The wisdom? Everything that distinguishes men from what we understand by a clod of the valley. This seems to be a simple and incontrovertible history of intellectual being. And, if it be true, then our accumulations have been incessant in the time that has gone. So, as long as we continue to perceive, to remember or reflect, they must perpetually increase. End of section 9